Hello and welcome to part three of the Django e-commerce project. So this is a maybe a little segue from the main project development. In this tutorial, I want to simply just show you how to utilize some of the Django queries to use the database design that we developed in part one and part two of this project. Uh, so we're going to explore some simple and then more complex aspects of Django querying for beginners. And then we'll go ahead and create a, a simple filtering system where we filter products and we utilize all the tables that we've developed so far in our database design. The code in this tutorial, we won't move this forward into the kind of main development process. It will just be for our own personal development and understanding of Django. If you have missed any of the other tutorials leading up to this tutorial, just head over to the home of the channel here on YouTube and just navigate down here. You'll find Django Projects Mastery and you'll find the Django e-commerce project version two right there. So just click on the playlist and you'll be able to access the previous tutorials. Just a quick recap for those who did miss the past tutorials. And then that kind of leads nicely into what this tutorial is for. So in part one, we developed a database design for part of the e-commerce system, if you like. So we developed the inventory app. So we went on and developed that app. And then in part two, we implemented it utilizing Django. So we created the models. We then built some data fixtures, went through the process, considering and thinking about a test first approach. So in addition to that, we also implemented our testing environment and that leads us now up to this tutorial. So we're already six, seven hours into this project and all we've done is really developed a database and implemented it in Django, started to think about testing and creating our testing platform. So I wanted just to give for those new to Django an idea of how you would actually access the data inside of our new designed set of tables. So this tutorial really is focused on the anyone new to Django who wants to learn how to actually access the data from our from our database. So this is the example. So this is, doesn't exactly match all the tables, but it gives you an overview of what we're working with here. So in this tutorial, I want to show you how to use some of the Django toolkit to actually select and extract data from our database. This is a fairly complex set of tables relations. So this is a good example for us to learn a little bit about how to utilize and create Django queries. So very much uh, focused on the beginner or, or those who want a little bit of a refresher or want to know how to, in the most basic way, select data from our set of tables. So here we're going to look at filters, value, get, annotation, and then focus on more kind of proprietary Postgres database tools like distinct and array ag. So we will be utilizing Postgres database moving towards that. So in this tutorial, we will have uh, the need for Docker or you can install Postgres on your system. So I am promoting the use of Docker in this tutorial. So in addition to that, I thought we'll actually put this into action and build a very simple product filter. So we will go ahead utilizing Django templates in this tutorial and create a very simple product filter. So what we end up with in this tutorial is a very simple website, a skeleton website, whereby the user can go to the home page, select the category. That will take you to the individual category page. You'll see all the products related to that category. Then you can select those individual products and that'll take you to the product page. And remember in this, in this uh, setup here, what's happening here is that we have the main product and then remember we have the different types of products. So we might have a shoe and there's all different colors. So the whole idea is to have a product inventory table, which will hold every single product that you're currently storing maybe um, in your inventory. So you're storing the same shoe 12 times for all the different colors, for example. And then if you remember here, we had the attributes and values um, associated to those products. We kind of separated that out. So. This is going to showcase how to potentially create a very simple filtering system 
um, so that you can on your page select those different options as you would do for example if you went to any store and you could select the certain sizes and so on so we we create a very simple filtering system for that type of setup so just to formalize this so by the end of this tutorial we would have created a set of queries or you would have learned how to create some very simple queries for this inventory app we would have then developed a basic product filtering system and implemented some tools to help monitor and view queries and their performance so this is a preview of what we're going to develop in this tutorial now this isn't something that we're going to take forward in this project this is purely for the purpose of learning some basics of Django or querying in Django to extract data from the database and to think about creating some sort of basic filtering system. Again, this is developed for and designed for beginners to Django and for those who wanted to just to start to explore the database that was developed. So I emphasize the basicness of this. So we can see here that we've, we're going to create a, a simple query that's going to extract categories from the category table. Very simple. And this is going to be connected because all the data now of our fixtures are going to be installed. So this is going to connect to the data that's in the database. So there's one item in our database that's connected to the category fit or table, or sorry, the category um, basketball. So there's one shoe connected to that category basketball, and then we'll be able to select the individual items. Of course, some categories will have more um, heels. That one doesn't work. So there is some issues here, and this is worth pointing out here. So for example, here you can see that the data does need a little bit cleaning in the fixtures. So this question mark here, I believe is um, breaking this slug slightly so you will find that and i will slowly uh, start to clean some of this up but most of these are working uh, so let's just go into one of these items and you can now see we're going to create a very fil simple filtering system so when you click on the different items so for example this shoe has multiple options so there are different options of this shoe so for example there is a blue size five and there's a blue size six. You can see that the SKU, that's the individual product ID is changing. So in the background here, these are all items in the inventory table. Let's just go back to the set of tables. If you can just, if you can just see this. So you can probably, it's a little bit blurry, but you can, this is the product inventory. So the main product is stored here, then the individual items based upon that product. So each product might have say four or five different types, um, different colors, etc. So they will be individually stored here in the product inventory. So again, it's just imagining that if you actually were going to sell products of shoots, you would have the red shoe, you would have the green shoe, the red shoe, the green shoe, the, the white shoe. These are the individual products you would have in your stock room. And this is what the product inventory table is trying to um, simulate. This is all the products that you actually have physically um, or not in your store. So that's connected to attributes. So the whole idea here was to basically create a filtering system whereby you would be able to select the main product and then that would take you to the product page like you would any invent any kind of e-commerce store uh, then you can then select the individual items so here you can see we're going to create a very simple filtering system whereby we can select the different versions of this particular shoe in this case so by going through that very simple example we will actually use just about every single table that we developed apart from the media that's just something that i've ignored for this tutorial but you'll get the general idea from completing this tutorial how you could bring the the image in so from this tutorial we'll be extracting information from a category table we'll be also needing product table information and product inventory table information and then in addition to that we're set up which i think we've already done in our data fixtures some attributes we need to set up some more and then in addition to that we're also going to set up this table here which we hadn't done in the second tutorial we missed this out I simply wanted to introduce it into this tutorial because it makes more sense when it's introduced in this tutorial rather than just developing it and this is actually going to be linked to the product attribute table not this table here so we'll see that in action also in this tutorial so we start by downloading the previous versions 
of the project and we're going to start there and just build upon that project now i have already created part three so if we do go through the tutorial you can follow the code and the code will be there to help you if you didn't want to uh, write it out if you just wanted to copy and paste it into your project if you're following this step by step then all the code is there in part three so we're going to go ahead and just download this and then we'll extract part two and then we'll load up our virtual environment and then we'll start from there so i've downloaded part two or the code in the repository i've then extracted part two code into a folder a new folder called project and I've opened it up now in Visual Studio Code. And I've removed some of the zip files here. Don't need those. And now we can move forward. So let's go ahead and create a virtual env environment. So here I'm on the Mac. So it's slightly different from if you're running Windows. So I've already done this on the Mac. So if you are running Windows, you're going to need to type in PY-M and then VEMV, VEMV. And that's going to allow you to create a virtual environment or the folder, VEMV folder. So that's on the Windows machine. And then if you're on Windows, you're then gonna to need to type in VEMV. So if you just type in V then tab, it will come up with the folder and then backslash and then capital S and press tab that I come up with scripts and then A and then press tab and then it come up with activate, press activate and you should um, have a nice little VE, VEMV um, on the left hand side here so to do that in the mac i'm going to need to type in source and then it's in the bin on a mac and then activate you can see i've got vemv here on the left hand side right so now i've got that in place and let's go ahead now and just pip install minus r so whether you're on mac or windows exactly the same requirements so these are the requirements. These are all dependencies or the modules or the packages that are going to be needed in order to get this software working. So I created that at the end of the last tutorial so that we could easily get this started. So now we can just type in Python 3 or just Pi if you're on Windows and then manage.py and then run server. So that should run the server or start. So you can see that there's some uh, migrations that will need to be applied. I said just simply wanted to get to see if that was working you can see that it says the port is being utilized because i already have uh, the previous version running or a previous uh, copy running on a different screen there so that just checks to make sure if it's running so in the previous tutorial we created an app called demo so this is a an app that won't get actually implemented um, deployed when we actually build and prepare our application for deployment. So this is just something that we can utilize. And I wanted you to get into this idea of that, although we've already created an inventory app, typically the build from there would be, we would create some uh, new templates and then we would go on and build those templates and create some CSS and so on and so on inside the inventory. But I wanted to kind of decouple the inventory app and make it kind of a standalone app dedicated just with the models and the testing. And then I'm going to use other apps to kind of hook into that. So I don't want to put anything inside of this inventory app other than kind of the core aspects that are needed to get the inventory aspects working. So what will probably happen with this application later on is we'll create a new app called Inventory um, Front End, for example, and then we could build the front end in that app and we could then kind of uh, if we wanted to create different versions um, of our front end and instead of having it inside of here in our actual inventory app here it kind of allows us to break away from that and create different versions and make our application a little bit more flexible so in our demo here we're going to do kind of exactly that we're going to now create some templates inside of our demo and then we're going to slowly build what you saw earlier in the preview so this is just taking you through the basic setup of a, a traditional Django application where we're using the Django templates. And like, I just want to reiterate that we're not going to actually deploy this. This is just for demonstration and learning a little bit about querying in Django. So we're going to create a new folder. So we're going to need some templates. We're going to need to serve some HTML pages to the users. So we'll create a new folder here in the demo and we'll call this templates. 
So Django looks for a folder called templates uh, automatically for any kind of HTML templates associated to that app. So we can just create a new folder there called templates. And then inside of that, we're going to need some templates. But just for now, we want to get things working. So let's create a new file called base.html. And inside of here, we'll just say, hello world, just for now. So we just want to get this working to begin with, then we build upon it. All right, so that's the base.html page. Let me just bring this down. All right, so we've got a template. So let's just think about how this works. A user will type in a domain name or an address and then Django will pick that address up and then it's going to match it against something. So it's going to check to see if that address appears or is related to this project. So in the URLs, at the moment, we just have one URL. I'll just remove this. We don't need that. So we just have one URL, which is admin. Okay, so what we're going to need to do here is just extend the admin URL. So we're going to create a new URL list here and that's going to extend the main URL list. So remember our main project settings here is in the e-commerce folder. So like I said, to kind of get the picture in your mind, so if I were to type in 127.001 slash, and I wanted to go to the home, so I type in home slash, that needs to be matched up, that home slash needs to be matched up with one of those URL patterns. And these URL patterns are connected to a view. And then in our view, we can get data from a database and obviously send back a response to the user and so on. So each URL path is connected to a view that's connected to a database and templates, and that's then re sent back to the user. So that's kind of the general overview of how kind of Django is working behind the scenes. So what we're going to need to do now is bring in uh, include here, and that's going to allow us to kind of extend our URLs and allow us then to build a new URL list to extend this list in the demo app. So we're kind of just making sure that everything related to the demo is inside the demo folder. So let's go ahead now and create a new path. So here we're going to create a new path and that's going to be connected to the demo. So this is just going to have demo slash. So now then when we type in to the browser, we're going to have to type in 127001 colon 8000 slash demo. And that's going to take us then to all the kind of demo links that we're going to build. So we're now going to include the file that we haven't built yet. And that's going to be e that's going to be e-commerce. Oh, apologies. E-commerce. And inside of e-commerce we have demo. Zoom in a little bit for you. And then inside of demo we have URLs. Okay, so that's the URL file. So we're saying e-commerce project and then the demo project app, sorry. And then inside of demo, we're gonna need a new file called URLs. So let's go ahead and make that URLs.py. And then that's a reference point for some more URLs. So we're gonna have a namespace. So this doesn't really, it's hard to explain what this is without really showing you. We're not really gonna be utilizing this, but just um, for the sake of that we can do this. So we're just gonna have a namespace of demo. And later on, when we're trying to connect or build um, dynamic links on our templates, it allows us to really kind of uh, specify applications and links. So for example, if I wanted to actually create a link um, without actually um, explicitly writing it out in my template, I could use this namespace system to select a URL from the list that exists in my URL paths to kind of generate a URL automatically for me or dynamically for me. So I've now connected this to the URL page here in the demo. So we can now go into demo. Let's just uh, copy this. We go into the URLs in the demo and then we will get rid of all this. Now we're gonna need, we need that. So now we can just extend, we can now extend this list, if you like. If I can zoom in a little bit. So let's go ahead now and create a new home. So we're not going to have anything in there. And now we need to connect it to a view. 
So of course we don't actually have a view at the moment. Uh, we don't have any views. So let's just go ahead and add views uh, dot home. So we just call this home and then we'll give this a name equals home. Okay, so now you can see that this path, which is empty, which means that whenever someone types in 127001 colon 8000 then demo, it's going to go to this path here and then it's going to look for the home page if you like. So the home is denoted here in this empty. So that's going to then start to look for the view called home. So this view doesn't exist yet. So we're going to need to import this in. So from dot import views. So this is a reference to a module that doesn't exist yet. So we're going to have to right click and create a new file here in demo called views.py. So we've now connected up to views and we're going to need to make a, let's just put on the auto save. So we're now going to have to make a, a new function here in our views. So let's do exactly that. So um, dev home. And then we're going to need to take in the request. So if you like here, what we're doing is that the user types in the our path in the browser and that starts off a request. And there's lots of information connected to that. And we're going to pass that into this function. Um, so that we can utilize it, do something with it if we need to, and then send a, a reply back to the user. So we're just going to return here. So we'll return uh, the render. So render is a function that basically tells Django to return a uh, request, put things together, and what things it needs to put together, for example, is the template. So index.html. So oh, actually, our template Let's have a quick look again. It was just called base, wasn't it? So we're going to connect this to the base template that we built earlier. And you can see that render is something that we're going to need to bring into the project. So from uh, Django.shortcuts uh, import render. Okay. And there we go. So with that in place, uh, we now have a URL. So these URLs are going to be checked. It's then going to match the URL to the URL that's in here. That's connected to the view called home. And we connected that up here. And then we created a view and we just need to make sure that's saved. Yep, it's auto save. And that's then connected to our template called base. So hopefully now we try and start our server again. Um, you can see that we're gonna need an app name, apologies, I've forgotten that. So in the demo URLs, we're gonna need an app underscore name and that needs to match the namespace that we created earlier so that was called demo so back in the main urls here you can see that we created this namespace called demo so that needs to match the app name here and that's kind of a reference point that we can utilize when we're creating dynamic links in our templates right so you can now see that the server is running which is all good so we can now go over and have a look to see if it works so now when I hover over, when I navigate to 127001800, you can see that it takes me to the home page. It tells me that there's two links available. So that obviously correlates to the URLs in the main URL page here, the paths here, admin and demo. Okay, so that's where it correlates here. And you can see now if I then navigate to slash demo, that should take me to the page that we just created here um, called it was called, what was it called, base? And then you can see we, we can now see Hello World on the screen. So now we're ready to start to build some queries. So again, I'm assuming that you know very little about queries in Django. And we're just gonna run through some basic queries and slowly build up to some more complex queries. And hopefully by the end of this tutorial, you'll have a general idea of how to start querying the database and how specifically to use the database that we've developed so far. So as I alluded to it in the preview, we are going to be utilizing a Postgres database. So there's two options here. You can either install Postgres database. So just go over to the website, install it and start running, or you could utilize Docker. So my choice here is Docker, just simply because it's so simple. 
So what you're going to need to do first is go ahead and download Docker if you don't already have it. If you type in Docker Desktop into Google, that'll take you to the product page where you can download Docker Desktop. Now, Docker is becoming such a popular tool nowadays for developers. If you haven't started utilizing it, it's probably worth starting to think about utilizing it. So download Docker for your version, your operating system, whether Windows, Linux, or Mac, and that will download Docker Desktop. And literally, once it's actually installed, there might be a kind of a uh, get started just uh, stop that. You won't need that at all. As long as it's running, everything else will be absolutely fine. We're not actually going to be utilizing anything else uh, in this next couple of tutorials other than it's just going to run in the background. So the whole concept here is that Docker is going to containerize, if you like, a version of Postgres database. So we're essentially going to run a database or that software inside of a container. So that prevents us from having to install it, going through all of those issues. And a lot of people don't like installing new software onto their machines. So this way allows you to simply just install software in containers. And that is kind of like a virtualized environment away from your main computer system. So go ahead and download that, install it, restart if you need to. And once you've done that, we can go back and start to now kind of build a container to actually then run a Postgres database. All right, so now we need to set up a Postgres database. So we're going to do that programmatically. So we're going to create a new file here. And essentially, we're going to create a script to tell Docker to download Postgres and then to start running it in a container. So let's go ahead and create a new file in this e-commerce folder here. We're going to call this Docker Compose. And that's going to be a YAML file. OK, so this is a script uh, that we're going to literally just create a simple script to tell Docker what to do in terms of setting up a Postgres database. So Postgres database will already be configured and set up. So we're going to download an image from Docker and that's going to be already set up and we're literally just going to run it, start a container and Postgres database is going to be running inside of a container. So just a little bit of an introduction here then. So we're going to use the, the code version if you like. Um, uh, we're going to use 3.8. OK, so then we're going to need to define some services. Now, tabbing here is really important. So just take um, just keep note of where I've kind of made tabs. So first of all, we're going to define some services. I'm going to call this PGDB, Postgres database, and we're going to create a, a new container. Um, so we're going to give a container a name. I like to give it a name. So this is going to call Postgres database and then e-commerce e-commerce so that's going to be the name of the container so i know what the container is running and then we're now going to need an image so an image is if you like um like a blueprint um of something that you want to run so here for example everything is already pre-configured on an image and set up so that you literally just run an image and that then builds a container so a container is essentially a, a lightweight computer, if you like, running the software that you've designated, in this case, Postgres database. So we're telling it to download Postgres. That's the name of the image that's been stored on Docker Hub. So if you're interested in to know where these images come from, uh, just explore using Google Docker Hub. And there's all sorts of images there, um, software, etc. So we're going to say that if, for example, this service stops we're going to start to or we're going to try and restart it so it's always on and then we're going to need to then map some ports so there's no way into this container um, or out of the container unless we actually define the ports in and out of the container so this service is running on 5432 so that's the port that it's running on so when we're trying to find this Postgres database in this container, we're going to send messages to the 5432 port. And that port is going to be attached from our computer to the container. So we're literally just setting up a pathway into the container. So we can send messages into the container and actually then access our database. This is why we're setting up these ports here. And then we can then set up some more kind of environment 
variables. So if you have a look at Docker Hub at the images, it gives you a whole heap of stuff you can do. So we're going to set the Postgres um, DB equals. So we're going to call the database Postgres. So these are going to be passed into the container to kind of set up the container and all the different variables that we can do. And there's loads of them. So we do the same thing again um, for the username and password. Um, so this is going to be user. So we can set up the username and the password. So I'm just going to go for all Postgres and then uh, password. That's going to also equal Postgres. Okay. So that's my environment variable set up. So I simply just set up the container with this image and it always starts if it kind of fails, it's just going to try and start running again. And we've mapped the ports over so we can send messages in and out of the container. And that's pretty much all we're going to need. So now we've defined that, let's just give this a go. So we just need to open up the uh, console again and we just need to type in as long as you, you have to have Docker running at this point. So if we just type in docker compose up, uh, that should then add ports. Okay, that was a good point. So a bit of a typo there, should be ports. So at this point, we should be able to just write, type in docker compose up, and then what will happen in docker, let's have a little look. I think I've already got one running. So that will come up. Here we go. So um, when you run the command docker compose up, what's going to happen? It's going to download an image. So it might take a couple of seconds because the image is 300 meg. So it's going to download the Postgres image that you've defined. And then if I can expand this a little bit. And then you can see here what we have is containers. So we have this container running here. And this is called PGDB e-commerce. That's what we named it. And you can see that it's running. It says here running. You might not be able to see that on your screen. So our database now is running in this container. So we can now start to utilize it. So let me just go ahead now and configure the actual application now to actually utilize that database. Because at the moment, if we go into e-commerce here, and then if we then go into, for example, the settings, if you can see down here, we have a database section. And at the moment, this database is configured to utilize a SQLite database. So what we need to do is just um, comment that out. And now we need a new configuration for our new database. So you can see here that we start off with database equals. So it's just, I've just copied out here um, and I've got default and I've just removed the engine and the name because now of course, we're gonna need new engine, which is gonna be the Postgres database engine. And we're gonna to need to set up the name and user and host and port for this database. So let me just bring this in. So this is the engine, Django DB backend, Postgres SQL, PSY cop G2. Okay, so that's the new engine for Postgres database. We now have the name, which was Postgres. That's the name we provided, remember, in our Docker Compose file when we created the instance or our, or our um, container. So that was the Postgres database name right here. And then we just need to set the user and the password. That's what we set up in our Docker Compose file. And then the host, 127001, so the loopback address on our machine. And then port was 5432. That's what we've defined in our Docker here. So that's the default port that, uh, that Postgres database utilizes and watches out for for requests. So that's pretty much all we're going to need there. So next up, we're going to need some sort of way of translating our requests into something that Postgres database can actually understand. So we're going to need some sort of way of communicating. So we're going to need to install a new kind of uh, package for that. So let's go ahead and do that now. So the bad news here is if you're running Python 3.10, this probably isn't going to work for you. You'll probably need to kind of downgrade to 3.9. I think I downgraded to 3.9.1 for this tutorial. Let me just double check. Okay, there we go. 
And so what we're going to do now is pip install. And there's a couple of things you can do here, but we're going to install the binary um, because we're on a Mac here. Um, so 2.binary and then we'll use 2.9.2. Okay, so we'll give that a go. So like I said, this is basically the instruction set to allow us to send messages back and forth to our Postgres database. And you can see that's installed nicely. So I can now pip uh, freeze uh, requirements dot text. So I just put that into my requirements text. So that's all now saved when I restart the project. So if you haven't seen the requirements file, what we just did there was made a, a copy of all the requirements to get this project working. Uh, so we've just added the Postgres, uh, where is it? The Postgres binary 2.9.2. Um, so that was added now to our list. And like we did at the start of the project, we loaded all this up to get our project working. So now we need some tables, right? So uh, let's go ahead and add some data and some tables to our database. Now, to do this, we're going to, if you remember from the previous tutorial, we were loading fixtures. Um, we were creating a migrations and migrating. This is all one command that would migrate, make migrations, and then it would then go ahead and insert all this data that we created. So that's all in the inventory fixtures here. So we created a bunch of data fixtures um, that will then get inserted into the database. So let's just go ahead and just test this out and then we close everything down and then I'll take you through what I've done in terms of the fixtures because I've created a whole bunch more fixtures for our database. So our management command, our custom management command was called load fixtures. So we're going to need to run uh, Python 3 or just Py if you're running Windows and then manage.py and then we're going to need to run our command so load fixtures so remember it's going to run make migrations then migrate and then it's going to load all the data so if everything is set up correctly um oh, there looks to be a problem here okay so if you do receive that problem it looks like what's happened I'll just close all this down. It looks like what's happened is that if you go into e-commerce and inventory and then migrations, you can see that something's already been migrated because I didn't remove it in the repository. So if there already isn't a migration, then we can't migrate again. You can see that it's going to cause a problem. So what we need to do is make sure that there isn't a migration inside of our inventory migrations area here. And then we need to then go ahead and just double check to make sure an SQL database didn't appear. Nope. So that's pretty much all we need to do there. So now we can go ahead and do the same thing again. Give us a go. So it says here that web ID. Okay, so it looks like we've got some issues here with maybe our data. Um, probably what's happened is in our database, some tables were created. So let's go ahead and just clean things up. So it's just good practice. Um, so we need to go ahead and just delete that migration from the inventory migrations. Let's go ahead and open up Docker. And if you can kind of see this, what I'm gonna do is just select my containers and I'm gonna just uh, delete the container. Okay, so now I don't have any containers now. I don't want to delete the image. That's just an image that we're going to utilize to build a container. It's going to be the same every single time. And the environment variables that we've set up, those are going to be applied every time we create a new container. All right, so we got rid of the containers. So we can do it programmatically, but I'm assuming that you're probably new to this. So let's go ahead now and run our previous command, which is docker compose up. And you're going to see that's going to create a a new set of containers. Now I'm using the command here and you can see that in the terminal, it's given me all the output from the container. So what I need to do is make a, I need to make a new shell or set out a new shell if I'm moving this way. We don't have to do that. We can kind of use silent mode so you don't get all this output, but that's just all the output again from the container as if you're kind of logged into the system and looking at the kind of command prompt. 
So we're going to need to go back into and create a new, create a new terminal here. So you can see that we're not in the virtual environment. So we're going to need to activate that very quickly. And now we can go ahead and run our command again. So that set up a new database. So you can see that we don't have the migration in inventory. That's all good. So let's go to the demo. You can see that the management command is load fixture. So let's just go ahead and load that fixture again. Sorry, load fixtures. So the management command. You can see this time everything is working nicely. So what happened last time was that we tried to start the process. It created some tables and then at that point we just had to move back because we needed to delete the migrations and the, the database and start again. So what's happened now is we've successfully started to build some tables in our Postgres database and we're now installing all of the fixtures. Um, from the inventory app here and all the fixtures we're now installing all that data into the tables now if you're not entirely sure what's going on here maybe um, that's potentially because you've not seen the previous tutorial uh, if that's the case all of this was explained in the previous tutorial um, essentially what's happening here while we're waiting for this to add into our database what we've done here inside of our load fixtures you can see that we've created the mic mate we've run the make migrations command and migrate by running this one command. And that's then going to add all the tables from our models here. This is in our inventory app. We've made all our models. So what we've done now is we create some fixtures. So some data that's going to be inserted into the tables and our management command, our custom management command here, is just loading all of those fixtures into our tables. And you can see it's taken quite a long time to do that because there's quite a lot of data that's being inserted. If we were just creating or just running a SQL Lite database, that wouldn't take too long. And of course you can do that. If you go back into your settings, uh, what you can do now, if you just want to kind of practice, uh, with the data or change things around etc just to try things out you can now just comment out this database here that we've set out on um, the postgres database and just um, reactivate this code here and that will then simply run the sql light database instead so just go ahead and comment out whatever database you want to use so if you are finding you having trouble here you can follow most of this tutorial, but at the end, we do start to use some very um, proprietary tools, commands uh, for Postgres database. So you won't be able to follow the, the complete tutorial. So now we have our database set up. I was going to take you through the process of logging in and having a look at the database, but there's no need um, at this point. Uh, if you are interested in that, I have... Um, created many tutorials before showing how to use PG admin. So for example, I'll add some code here and you'll find this in the repository. This is the code for PG admin. Uh, this is going to allow you to kind of set up a PG admin um, service in another container and you'll be able to activate it, act it, you'll be able to look at your tables and databases through that. But we'll look at that at a different, uh, in a different tutorial. And like I said, have a look at some of the other Postgres database tutorials and I'll take you through how to utilize that. Right, so that's now finished. So let's just close all of this down here. So now we have all that in place. Let's just close all that down. And now we can go into, for example, the demo app and let's go back to the views so let's now start utilizing and uh, querying our database data extracting it from a table and then displaying it in our templates so let's start with the probably the most basic query so a query being uh, an instruction to essentially do something to the data um, extract oh sorry select data from the table um, or potentially insert data into the table. So queries are instructions for our database. So let's go ahead now and create a, a category 
function. Uh, we're going to create a new page and so on. So we're taking the request as per normal. And let's just set out probably one of the most kind of basic queries that we can run, the select all query. So we're going to need models. So we're going to need to specify uh, which where we want to run queries. So at this point, we're going to need to bring in our models. So from e-commerce uh, and dot inventory, because inventory app has all of our models, we're going to import uh, models. So this is essentially a way of just importing all the models and we could select them individually if we wanted to, but we know that we're pretty much going to be utilizing them all. So data equals models. So this is a reference to the inventory models. Now we need to specify what model. So we're going to have a look at the category model and we're going to select everything from it. So we say objects uh, dot all. Okay, so this is basically the most simplest type of query we can run. Uh, so what's happening here is that we're going to select all the data from the category table. So all being all data from the category table. Now what we can do here is we can simply just return. So let's go ahead and return this. So like we did before, we're going to return render and then return the request data. And then now we're going to need a new, uh, we're going to need a new page called categories.html. And then we're going to need to send data back to the template. So we do that through context here. So we'll say that uh, data, the name data. So eventually, essentially, this is a kind of key value. So we know that the data here is currently uh, being returned in this variable data. So we're going to send that data across to our template, categories template, and it's referenced as data. So if I want to find this data and utilize it on my template, I'm going to reference it as data. So I'm going to find it through data. So that's how to send data back to our template. Let's just bring this, this in a bit. Okay, so now I'm going to need a, a new template. Let's go ahead and create that. HTML. Okay, so we've selected everything from categories table and now we're going to uh, send it across to our categories. Okay, so here let's just go ahead and extract our data out. So we're going to need to loop through the data. So what we're returning here is a query set. So that is a, a number of uh, a number of data. So it's not a single piece of data, it's a number um, it's multiple data that's being returned. So if, for example, I was just to print this out, this is always a, a good thing to do. Um, if I were to print this out, then we can see what's happening. And that just allows us to understand a little bit more about what's happening, what we're returning before we then return it onto the page. Now, what we're going to need to do here, remember, we've set out a, we've got a template and now we've got a view, but we're also going to need a URL for this. So let's go ahead and now build a new URL for this. So we can call this, for example, either category or categories. So let's just call this categories and slash. And then we connect that to the views dot category. Just views category. Uh, so let's just double check that. So it was called category. So we connected that up. So we've got the URL. That's connected. We need a comma here. We connected that to our views. Um, we need a comma there or two. And the category view. So hopefully now, if we go back and start, we run our server. Let's just see this working. Let's just go ahead and just put categories here. So we've got something outputted. Okay, so back in our browser, let's go ahead and type in 127.0.1 and we need 8,000 on that. So you can see we have demo. Okay, so slash demo. And we have, this is the root. So we're now going to need to type in categories. The categories? Yep. Okay, so now we're on the categories page. You can just see that probably on your screen. It's a little bit small. So let's now actually grab some data 
and return it. So one thing you did notice that we run that page and you can now see I'm printing out all the data that is being returned. And you can see here that this is a return in the query set here and there's lots of different items. So I'm going to need to loop around that data and extract out um, all the data. So you can see here that um, we've got this key value setup, uh, key category value formal. So these are all the actual categories that are currently in our system. So if you wonder where they even come from, remember we've got our in the in the in the inventory here. Remember, with this data has been inserted via these fixtures. So if you go over to the category fixture here, you'll see these are categories: fashion, category one, woman, category two, shoe. So we've inserted those into our database already. So that's where the categories are actually coming from and why they're actually being printed out. So that was being printed out um, via here. That's always a good way to see what's happening before you then go ahead and actually put it onto the template. So let's go ahead now and just create a kind of what is a very simple loop so that we can loop out our data on our page. So let's go for a four. Now, if you have the Django extension installed. You can literally just type in four and then everything is set up for you. So what we're going to do is for X in and then this the data. So we're going to say every time every bit of data that gets looped around, we're going to loop around here uh, until every bit of data has been looped around. Every time we loop this data for every item that's going to be placed into X. And then what we can do with X is we can print something out. So um, let's remember uh, what the we need to go back into. We need to know what to print out. So if we go into there's always lots of things open. If we go into our models and categories, what can we print out? So this is our category model. So we could print out the name. We could print out the slug or is active parent and so on. So let's just go ahead and just print out the name. So what's happening here is every time we loop around, one item is being placed into X and then we can go ahead and in X, we can just print out the name. So if we do that and then go back and refresh, and there we go. So we printed out every single category name that's currently in our database. So that's the most simplest way of extracting uh, querying and extracting data into our database. Now you might be wondering why are we not using SQL? Well, that's because of the database ORM. So Django comes with a very powerful ORM, which is essentially a tool which translates our native code here, our Python code into an SQL code behind the scenes. So what we can do, let's go ahead and just grab, let's just grab this query. And let's just go ahead and print and then this query dot and then query. So let's go ahead and just run this page again. So we're just going to refresh and let's go back here. Let's go down to the bottom and you can see that what's been printed out here now is the actual query that's being run. So select category inventory category ID category name inventory blah 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 so you can see the actual query that's actually being run so at this point I'm not going to concern myself too much about the actual query this is just really showcasing in this tutorial how to actually extract information and start utilizing the model and uh, the, the relations and tables that we've set up so that now is the categories table. So let's go ahead now and just tidy this up slightly. What we're going to do is we're just going to set out a simple kind of framework. So let's just go over to bootstrap. Uh, yeah, bootstrap, getbootstrap.com. Go to docs and then we're just going to go down to the starter template. I'm just going to copy that starter template. Go back to my code and then go to base. And I'm just going to copy it in the base file. Right, I'm going to get rid of some of this text here. I'm just going to tidy this up. Um, okay, so I've just tidied that up and 
get rid of some of that. And then I'm going to move this script here. I'm going to cut that and I'm going to move it just below the CSS. There we go. So that's a nice little boilerplate for HTML. And what we're going to do here is if you've not used the template system before, we can inherit this page um, or include this page in other pages. So this is going to be my template. So what I'm going to do on other pages is I'm going to use this template and then insert the code that's on that specific page inside the, the body here. So let's create a new block. And this block is going to be called content. So we need a start and an end. So this page category page here is going to have or we're going to put everything inside of this block content. We're going to use this base. We're going to extend from this base inside this categories page. So instead of having to write this out every single page, we're just going to copy this page in all of our other pages when we need it. So here in my categories page, first thing I do is I extend. Extend. So I'm going to extend from base.html. So I'm basically just bringing all of that code into here and then I want to put new code in this block here and I'm going to define that here. So let's just go ahead and do that. So um, block starts and block ends. So that basically now gets inserted into this space here in the base HTML page. And there we go. So there's a little bit of kind of code reuse there. So let's go back into views. Let's just get rid of our print. We don't need that anymore. And now we can go into our page and refresh. And you can see that the the text font has changed because we're now utilizing Bootstrap. So that just shows that it's working OK. Um, and now we're ready to move on. So now we just finish off in the categories here. Let's just create a new H1 tag. So we just know, we just know then what page we're working on, that's all. Right, so we've got that, the categories page, and then what we're going to do is build an index page. So I'm just going to now build a new template page called index.html. So that's going to be my entry point. Um, of course, that's going to extend. Uh, the base.html and then the content the block let's create a new block called contents and then inside of here it's just going to be a link so literally this is just going to link to the categories page so let's just call this h oh, can i do that no okay i don't have that installed so h1 let's just do this manually so this is going to be the home page home page and then on here we're going to add a link so let's go ahead and add a simple link a href equals and then that's going to send me to the categories page now I realize this is just kind of a hard link into the categories page it's a categories slash um, and then we just finish that off Okay, so let's just double check our URL. So it's the same as that. Okay, so that was in our index. And then that links to our category page. So what we're going to do, I'm just going to close all this. Okay, so now we've done that, let's go back into the demo URLs. At the moment, it's connect, the views is connected to the home. So we go into the home views. And that's connected at the top here to base. So now we need to change that to index. That's in our demo here. And now what we should be able to do is just refresh this page. Well, let's just go back to the home page for demo. Okay, so that isn't working. Not sure what's going on there. So remember, um, we have a template called index. So that's all good. So we've changed the index there in our view. I 
I see what the problem is in my index page here. I've got content instead of content. And so let's go back and just refresh. And there we go. So we've got the home page now connected to the categories page. So let's just display these categories um, utilizing maybe some links. So this is just going to demonstrate um, the namespacing like I was mentioning earlier. So let's now go and create this now into some sort of link. So this is going to be uh, a an a tag href equals. And then now what we can do is we can use that namespace we created earlier. Um, let's move this out. Okay, so here we're going to say uh, URL and then that's going to be demo. And that's going to be a name. Okay, so this has got to be um, now kind of a name to something. Now this something isn't going to uh, this isn't going to exist at the moment. So remember, so far we're in the categories here, and we want to link or connect, or sorry, we want to click on a category, and that's going to take us to a page. It's going to show us all the products related to that category. So all the products that are connected to that category. So we're going to need to um, say product uh, by. So we're going to need to make a name in our URLs called category product by categories that's going to allow us to kind of link to it and what we're going to need to do, also do is we're going to need to send across um, uh, what a piece of information so that we can actually in the background know what data we want to collect so category equals x dot slug so that's going to make a little bit more sense uh, shortly so we're then going to keep the name here and then we'll just finish off that link right there. Um, that's going to need a get there. And then we're going to also need after that, that. So that just finishes off the, the link. I think we're good there for now. Right. So with that in place, let's go ahead now and build the product by category actual um, page and get this kind of connected up. So let's go into the templates here, a new file, and I'm going to call that product by a uh, product by cat category. So this page is just going to show all the products um, based upon based upon that certain category. So the first thing we're going to need then is a URL. So let's go back into our URLs, create a new URL. So that's going to be path. And then that's going to be a product. Remember, this is a slug. So by dash and underscore category and then slash. And now I'm going to need to set a pass kind of some values because I'm going to need to know in the back end um, what category. So we're going to pass over uh, some data, so category, and then we're going to connect it to a view. So views dot, and we're going to call that product by cat category. We're going to call it that, and then we'll just give that a name. Now that name needs to be the same as um, what our dynamic link is going to be. So name equals, and then that's going to be product by uh, cat category. Okay, so we're going to need a comma here. That's why we're getting a mistake error there. So back here in the categories, you can see that what we've done is we've utilized demo. So in our URLs, we're using this namespace called app name, sorry, called demo. Okay, so we're saying, look at demo, look at these URL patterns, and then look for something called product by category. And that then details the actual URL. So we need this, we need this information to build a dynamic link uh, inside of our categories here. So that's going to build our dynamic link by doing that. But we're going to need to pass over some data too. So category equals x slug. Okay. 
so that's the actual slug of um, the category. So for example, um, if we go back, well, we'll see the example in a minute. So um, that gives you a rough idea at the moment. We'll connect all this up in a second. So that um, outlines our URLs. So now we need to go into the views and now set up our view and our query. Okay, so let's go ahead now and create a new function called, um, I can't remember now what it was called. Uh, I suppose it was called product by category. Yeah, product, uh, product by category. Okay, so that takes in the request as per normal, but this time we're also going to need to pass in our slug. So category. Okay, so let's go back to our URLs. Let's just close all these down again. So we're in our views. We're going to need the URL. So you can see here that we're passing a slug and it's called category. All right, so that's the data that we're passing over. So this is after the slash. So essentially what we're doing here is if we go into our URL here, we're saying not categories, we're saying product uh, by category cat category then we're saying slash and now we're going to send the slug over so that's the name of the actual category right so um, that piece of information that I'm typing in now that's the information that I'm passing over because I'm going to need that information so I use this category here so this left hand side is basically the type of data and this is then the reference to that data that's being typed in in this part here of the URL. So that's being passed over to my views. And now I'm going to basically grab that. So I'm going to pass that into my function here. And I can now utilize that to build to build a, a function. I'm sorry, to build a query. Because I'm going to need that to actually know what data to extract. Right, so let's go ahead and actually try and extract some data now from the database. So let's say uh, data equals, and then we're going to need models. So we need to select our model, uh, which is going to be the product. So it's trying to select a product, aren't we, based upon the category. So we're going to say data equals. Now, data equals uh, product dot objects. Objects, and then we're going to now run a filter. So a filter allows us to build a special type of query. So here, for example, in our previous query, we created a select all. So we're utilizing all. A filter is going to allow us to run a where query. So, for example, here in kind of normal terms, select all from product, the product table, and then we're going to run filter. So where? So now we can define some or read, refine exactly what we want to return. So where? So here, for example, we're going to say where category uh, name is equal to category. So we're taking in the data um, that's being passed in, the category name, and we're utilizing that to kind of create our our query. I'm going to get used to this. It's a bit sensitive. One more. <laughs> okay, I have to do. So, yeah, so we're saying select everything from the products table where um, the category name equals category. Okay, so something special is going on here. We've got the double underscore. So that denotes that I'm trying to utilize the, the foreign key between the two tables to traverse from one table to the other to collect the data. Because this name, this name exists not in the product table, but in the category table. So let's just take a look at the 
the set of tables again that you can probably just about see. So here we are in the product table, if I zoom in a little bit. Here we are uh, in, the, in the products table here. We're trying to collect all the information uh, or all the products in this table where the category equals whatever the category is passed in. Now, notice here we've got a many-to-many -many connection between product and category. So we do have this new kind of link table called product category, which Django automatically made for us. But that's kind of irrelevant. So inside of our category, although it doesn't say here, there is a name field. So apologies for not updating this. So if I just go back into the inventory models, you can see here in the category, we've got the name field. Okay. So what we're doing here is in the product table, we have a link from the product table. Um, so it's called a category. This is a, a foreign key, uh, which is going to allow us to kind of traverse over this table to the category table to check to see where the product is connected to the category. So what's happening in the background is that this product is connected to a category. So say it's category one. So for example, if I go into the fixtures, so if I go into my fixtures here and have a look at my category, yes, so fixture, fixture one, which is um, category one is fashion. So that's in my category table. Now, because there is a many to many connection, a new table has been made, a link table. So what's happening, for example, product one, when we built product one, we said that was connected to category one. So what happens here is that the product ID gets placed in the product category and the category ID one for that category one gets placed here as well. So I can query this table to see what this product is connected to, what categories via the IDs. So when I make a query in the product table, um, what I've done is I've used the the foreign key link um, across to the category field. So let me just kind of show you that. Uh, so if I go into if I go into the models again, if I go down to the product table, you can see you've got name, description, and then something called category, and that's connected to our category table. So it's a tree many to many field. So it's a many many to link over to the category table, but the reference point here is category. That's the important thing. So that's what I've typed in here, category. And then the double underscore is essentially telling Django to, to kind of traverse this link over to the corresponding table and look for where the name, the category name equals whatever the name of the category that's been passed in. So that's how we're kind of building that. So what's happening here behind the scenes is that the query is essentially taking the ID of this product and then it's then looking in the category field and it's then matching the category name. So it's grabbing the ID of that category name. So it's basketball. So it gets the category ID and it knows the two IDs at this point. So it knows the product ID and the category ID and then it can look inside the product category table to kind of match it up. If there is a match, that's what's going to be returned and displayed on the page. I apologize for the long-winded um, explanation. And I tried to kind of make it in kind of layman's terms rather than actually discussing exactly what's happening. But hopefully at this point, you've got a general idea of how that's kind of being traversed and we're finding that information. So let's go ahead and go back into the code and let's uh, now just print this out. So actually we'll do a return. So require re request um, and then our new template, which is called product by category HTML and that should just kind of load it out. Okay, so let's go back into our browser. So we have our home page that's connected to our categories here. And these are our categories. So let's just select, for example, woman. 
and you can now see that our link takes us to product by category and then woman. So you can see that that is working okay. Nothing is being returned yet. So let's just go back to our code and let's just see if this is working. So print and then just category. So let's just print out the category, see what's actually being returned. So um, for example, let's go to general purpose. So that's the link general purpose. So let's go back here and you can see that we're actually printing out general purpose. So you can see that we're actually capturing that information. Remember, we're capturing that information here because we've defined um, that. So slug, remember, is just a data type and then category is the actual kind of where the data is being stored or kind of a reference point, kind of key value uh, set up. That's being passed over to our view through our function here and then we're printing it out. So we are actually utilizing that to make our uh, query. So let's go ahead now and actually test this query. So let's go print and then data to see what's actually being returned. So let's just uh, refresh our page there. And we can now see that in actual fact it didn't return anything at all. That might be because there isn't, as, there isn't any products in that, um, in that category. So let's just go for boots. There's bound to be something there or not. And you can see here that in actual fact there is um, because if I just skip or if I just move up, you can see it's return a query set. And these are all the products that are inside of that category. Okay, so we are returning something, which is great. So all we need to do now, of course, is just um, print that out on the screen. So if we go into the product by categories, we just need to loop through that query set. So we're going to need to, like we did previously, just return this. So let's do the same thing again. Data, key value, data. Okay, and we can now just remove that. We know it's working. And we can just loop this out in our product by category template. So let's go ahead and do the same thing again. So we're going to need to extend from the base and then we can go ahead and now just build a simple kind of list. I guess that's probably the simplest way. So we're going to need to now loop. So we're going to need a for loop. So for x in data. So we're returning the, the data reference to as data. And now inside of here, we're going to create a new list. So let's uh, grab the name. And then potentially we're going to need the, yeah, let's just start with the name to begin with and see how that works. So let's just go back to our page and refresh. Okay, so it doesn't look like anything's been returned at the minute. So let's just double check this. So returning data, yep. So we are definitely, definitely do have some data here. Um, servers on. Okay, so we're going to need a block content block, of course. That's what the problem is. There we go. So hopefully now it will be output. There we go. Okay, so those are all the names of the products that are related to the category. And this is Boots. So it should be different for each category. So there isn't anything associated to fashion or woman. Shoes, baseball, there's one item, booties, casual, and so on. Okay. So I've gone ahead and added some more information. So I also want to return the ID and also the store price. Okay, so the store price at the moment actually isn't stored in the product table. So this is stored in the product inventory table. So I'm going to need some way of collecting that information so I can actually print it in or on this template. So let's take a look at that. So back in my views, we can see here that we created a, a query, which was querying the data. So all the product data 
we're using filter so where the category name equals category so we're looking for each product where the category name equals the category that we passed in so what we can do here in addition to kind of collecting all the information is we can also specify what data we want to actually collect for example so this gives us um, and allows us to kind of expand and think about some other aspects including maybe collecting data from other tables so because we know that we want to collect for example the price in addition to all of the other data from the, the product table um, we can use for example uh, values so let's go ahead now and use values so this allows us to essentially so, uh, one wrap on. Let this essentially allows us to kind of specify what we want to return or what field sorry so maybe id uh, excuse me id comma so that's the id so these are all field um, names inside of the product table and which you can have a look at name uh, and then we're going to need the slug for example so we can make a url and then create it at and so on so what we can also do is we can traverse this table so we can move from this table and collect other data so because we've made foreign key relationships uh, or one many to many relationships between different tables we can kind of move to the other table so for example here in the product inventory table there's something called product and that's a foreign key to this product table this is how we're making this many to one connection so we can use that reference as a way of kind of traversing from this table to this table and collecting data from this table so we'll do exactly that so back here in our models you can see that this is in the this is the product inventory table we have a reference here product related name product to the actual product table so this is a foreign key to the product table so we're going to utilize that to use a reverse foreign key link to this table and then collect data from this table so let's just uh, see that in action so let's go back into our views so let's just grab something from that table we know we want to grab the product price so let's go ahead and do that so product and then under underscore double underscore to kind of allow kind of dango to kind of initiate that look for foreign key reverse foreign keys and then inside of that table we're going to get the store price field and that's in relation to this product so there we go so we can do the same thing for example with the category table let's just get the category name so we can say category double underscore name double not triple name so we can also get the category name so that goes the other way to the category table so we would now for example we've gone from the product table to the category table to kind of get the name of the category that the product is associated with for example so now we've got that these are now reference points for data so if i go back into the products category here you see that i've uh, looped um, the data into x and then the name the id gets outputted and then i reference that data as we've defined it in our view here in our values so this is the actual data point that we're going to utilize to extract that information out so if we go back into here and now refresh we can now see we're actually extracting the price from the product inventory table and we're now including it here so this is the real benefit here of creating a table or a design sorry um, that is well organized that is normalized it allows us to very easily collect data from other tables and this type of system here i mean i could collect data from product i could use this double underscore system to extract information from here and then go into stock for example so i'm able to through the power of uh, foreign keys and relationships with these tables i'm able to collect data from stock from a query that i've utilized in product so for example if i were to then go into product uh, and then for example say uh, inside of here find the foreign key so product inventory so if i were to for example this is just an example at this point good in product then product uh, double underscore sorry product 
underscore inventory underscore underscore that's good then traversing from one table to the next table and then inside of here for example I could grab the units so I'm able to do that as well. So behind the scenes, the more I do this, the more complicated the query is and potentially then the more expensive that query is. So the more uh, processing time that's going to take. And obviously that then slows down potentially um, the system. So I do need to be careful of that ultimately. But what I'm just trying to do here is just showcase um, hopefully how simple it is to collect the data from our existing design in the most simplistic way. I'm not trying to show you the most or the best performance at the moment or considering performance. It's just really um, trying to get something running. So let's just uh, move that back. So we now know how to get the product store price and we could do the same thing for the category name if you added the category name here onto your template. So now we have the individual, the individual stock. Um, maybe we want to put a break here so that we can you know, tidy this up a little bit so that we can actually see the individual products. Um, go ahead and do that. This is just, just to really showcase the queries at this point. Right, so we're going to need some sort of link because we're now we want to select these individual items and go to the individual page for that item. So let's go ahead back in here and we're going to need to make some sort of link. So I'm thinking maybe after the name, we go ahead and in brackets, so we'll print the brackets out. Let's just um, go ahead and create some sort of link. So we'll just, uh, just lay out the, we'll just lay out the, the basics of this. So this is just going to be the X dot name there. And then we'll just end this link. Cool. Um, okay. So with that in place, uh, let's go ahead. Oh no, that's gonna. What I'm talking about. That's gonna be just be called view, isn't it? We just want to view this, right? So let's build a link now. So we're going to use the same type of setup as we did previously, and we're going to utilize the namespace here. So uh, demo. That's the namespace or the app name, and then we're going to go into product detail. So we haven't built this yet. So similar to what we did previously, um, we're going to need to create a new URL for this. So this is called product detail. So this is the individual product information. And then we're going to need a slug. We're going to need to pass in um, some information because we need to know what product we want to produce or to see what individual product. So that's going to be the slug. So we're going to pass in the slug information from X and that's going to be the slug. So if you're wondering what that is, if you just then go back into your models again, go into the product information, um, if you remember, we created a field called slug and we're utilizing that. We're utilizing that, um, which is a URL safe name. And we're passing that into um, here. Oh, sorry. We're passing that in uh, to actually build the actual link so that we can then link to the product. Right. So that's the link. Now, this shouldn't work at the moment. We'll probably get an error. We do this. Yep. OK, so um, we now need to go ahead now and create the product detail page. So let's go ahead back into the code. We're going to need to make a new template here. So this is going to be a new file. Let's call this product underscore detail dot HTML. OK, so product detail. Just on the page. OK, so we don't need anything else there. Let's create some new URLs for this. So this is the product detail page. So in our URL, um, let's create a new URL. Going crazy again, path. Okay, so here, this isn't gonna have any kind of prefix. Uh, it's just going to be the slug. Okay, so just the slug information. So notice this is a hierarchical uh, type of situation here. Django is going to look from the top. We need a comma at the end here. Django is going to look from the top to the bottom to match the URL. So if it finds product by category, then it's going to match that first. And then it's going to get down to the slug here. 
So you need to be careful where you put this because obviously this will get matched. If you put this at the start before categories and products, it's always going to be matched. So potentially it's going to cause you problems. So at the end here, if these items don't match, it potentially will match this slug item here. So let's go ahead and connect this to a view. So we're going to call this product detail. It's going to be the product detail. That should be views, of course. And then we need to make sure this name is product detail because that's what we've described it in our in our link that we just created, right? So product underscore detail. Okay, so that's that now connected. So remember here we created the product detail in demo. That was a link or a reference point to our app name here. So we can grab and create a kind of dynamic link. So what we're expecting in this link is just the kind of the slug information, right? So that's what we're referring to just here, slug equals x slug. So we're getting the slug information from x, the data that's being um, outputted at that point, and that's then building the slug or the URL here in this link. So now we've got that in place and uh, that's all set up. We now need to create our new view. So let's go ahead and create our new view here. So it's going to be called product detail and it's going to take in request and probably slug, right? So this is a, this is the page where we're going to need to make a kind of dynamic link. Oh, sorry. This is where we're going to create our filter. Sorry, uh, our filter. So let's just go ahead and return. Um, just to get this up and running. Um, so we're going to return the request and then the it was called product detail template. So let's just get it working to begin with. HTML, thank you. Right, so that's pretty much hopefully what we're going to need there. Uh, let's go back into our page, see if it works now. No. So product detail expected empty or import. Um, okay, so, oh, okay, let's just go back here, so demo works, so test, there we go, okay. So let's go ahead and just utilize this slug, so let's say data um, equals models dot product, so let's just grab kind of the product by the slug, right? So objects dot filter. So where? Um, so we want to grab an item from the product table where this filter where the slug equals slug. So remember in the models table, in the sorry, in the products table, there is a field called slug and that's an individual slug, unique slug per item. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pass in the slug into here and we're going to grab the item that's related to that so we'll then go ahead and just print the, the data there right so we're going to need a slug so let's go ahead and just go into our products attribute product 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 fixture so let's just grab a slug here while running sneakers okay so that's a, a slug so let's go ahead now and go into here and then we we'll just grab, put it right there. And we're still getting there. Okay. No attribute get. Okay. So I see what the problem is here. Sorry. I forgot the render. Okay. So to confirm then, so we're passing in the slug and then we're grabbing that slug information. We're matching it against the product, which equals that slug. So let's just go ahead and refresh again. And there we go. So the page is loading OK. And you can see here the query that we printed out in product wild star running sneakers. So that's also the name of the product. Remember, that's why it's saying that. So we've selected the item in the in the database via the slug. So we're using the slug here to pass that across to grab the data. OK, so let's um, let's just see this in action in terms of uh, let's just grab the the other page we had here. So 
this was um, the home page that takes us to categories that takes us to boots okay that doesn't work casual okay that's not working either empty for n did you forget register or load this tag okay so that's the demo product details okay let's go into basketball so the issue here is that you need to in line seven in the products by category code now we need to enter the url here i'm gonna master this zooming in business um, okay so yeah we're gonna need url here and then we can then just simply just go back uh, as well as i've just added a, a bracket here just finish that off and you can now see that everything's in place okay so we can now press view and that would take us then to the corresponding page but of course nothing's going to be displayed just yet so uh, let's go back here and have a look what we need to do right so in our views um what we need to be starting to think about now is that when we select the individual item in actual fact what we're going to need to do is not select from the product table but from the product inventory table okay so let's just take a look at the table set again so to get all the products related to category we utilize the product table to query um, against the category now we're looking at individual products so we want to know all the individual products that are associated to that category to, sorry to that pro one product so this new single product table um, page sorry we're going to collect all the products from this table so therefore we should be utilizing this table to make the query so let's just go back into our view here so we're going to select all data from product inventory where now in this case the slug that we're using that's being stored in the product table so our slug is in this product table here so we're going to need to traverse across again so we're going to use the product foreign key to move across and get that data from the product table okay so here you can see i've now changed the code to product underscore underscore slug equals slug and not just slug equals slug as we had before so with that in mind I can now start thinking about maybe outputting certain things. And one thing that I'm going to need is the name of the product. So the name of the product, remember, is, well, it's in the product table. So I'm going to need to grab that from that table. So by so to do that, of course, I'm going to need to uh, reference that. So that's going to be product underscore underscore and then name. So that's how I'm going to grab the name from that product table using the double underscore to do traverse from the table, the product inventory table to the product table. So uh, let's go ahead now and let's return some data and see if we can start to print this out. So we're going to reference this data. Data. So um, we need a comma there. Okay, so now we can output some of this data. So let's go back into. Now, this is important to understand that there might be more than one item here um, being outputted. Uh, so actually to get the product to output the product name, there's going to be multiple items with the same name. That's going to be important to understand. So let's now move back into the product detail page. So now what we want to do is we just want to output the, the name. So we're going to need to utilize, if we go back into here, okay, I've got control of zoom now. So we need to, we're gonna output the product name. That's what we want to output. So let's go back to the product detail. So here we're going to loop around all the items so here we are uh, looping the data out into x so we're going to say x dot and then product name i think that was right yeah product name okay so now we've done that let's press save let's go back into the web page 
So now we have the home page, which is connected to categories. And then we have the categories, which are connected to all the different items which are associated with that category. And then we can go into the individual item and that takes us in now and shows just the title. Of course, at this point, we could extract some more information. So let's go ahead while we're here and think about what actual data we want to get and display about each product. So we have ID. We'll probably want to also include the SKU. That's the unique number per product. And then let's go ahead and get the product name and then maybe the store price. So store and the store price. So these are just all the um, fields at the moment in the product inventory model. So that's a store price. And then potentially we need how many units we have. So product underscore inventory and then units. So this is, this is how many units we have of this product. Okay. And we seem to have a double there. So um, product inventory underscore underscore units. So here we have the stock table and that has a foreign key product inventory. So in this stock table, we're storing, for example, when the product was last checked in inventory, um, how many units you've got. So just kind of a stock control type of activities. And we've got a separate table for this. This information could well be in the product inventory table, but we've moved it out and we've made this one to one connection. So we're going to grab in this case the, the amount of units that we have per product. So let's just uh, put this now into action. So if we go back into the product details here. We're just going to make a, a set of items. So let's just copy in this. Let's just copy this. So we're going to, for example, utilize uh, the SK. We're going to output the name and then the SKU. And then after that, Let's just go for the product inventory units. So you can now see going back to the page and refreshing, we now have the name, the SKU number and the amount of products we have available. And remember that's coming from our stock table here. So that really gives you a good indication how you might utilize this table, the stock table, and utilizing connections between tables to traverse the, the table and collect data from different tables. Now, like I said previously, when you're doing this, um, I will explain at the end and talk a little bit about joins and what's actually happening if you're interested what's happening behind the scenes here. Um, but we have to be careful because when we make these joins, when we try and get data from other tables, we are, like I said previously, potentially we're making large queries, which is going to take longer for us to load and that's going to take more resources. So this is where optimization later on will help us create queries that don't cost as much. Um, maybe we need to start to think about our table designs to help improve performance ultimately. But like I said here, um, we're just trying to collect the data for now and learn a little bit about how we can simply select data from different tables and utilize this design. So for us to go further now and start to think about creating a filtering system for multiple products, we now need to expand the database. At the moment, what we have in our database is a set of data. And essentially what we've done is we've created one product. We've made around about 8,116 products. And then what we've done for the sub products or the product inventory is we've just created the same amount. So we have 8,000 in here as well. So this just matches. So what we're gonna to need to do now is to create some more data. So I've already gone ahead and done that. I won't be showcasing this in this tutorial, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna stick with the 8,000 products, 8,600 products, whatever it is. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make four products of each. So I'm going to make a, a shoe, or whatever the shoe is. I'm gonna make a red shoe, a blue shoe, a size six and a size seven shoe. So that's four items of each product. 
that we're going to build. So I'm simply just going to go ahead and create a larger data set, which you can view in the fixtures, which is going to replicate us utilizing or creating four new products for each individual product. So we're going to stock that. So that's going to be quite a lot of data there. In addition to that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some data here in the product attribute table and I'm going to set up and I'll show you the fixtures in a minute. I'm just explaining it at this point. I'm going to create some more attributes. So for example, shoe size and shoe color. Then in the attribute values, I'm going to set shoe color to five. Oh, so shoe color to red, shoe color to blue, and then shoe size to six and seven. So there's going to be four entries in the attribute values. And then what we're going to do here is I'm going to basically assign um, every single product um, inside of this here. So for every product, it will be associated to whatever attributes. So I'm also going to populate this table. And this is going to be quite a large table. Uh, oh, so in terms of the size of this table, because if I've got, for example, uh, 32,000 in the product inventory, I'm going to need probably a lot more here in the product attribute value table. So again, it's going to be quite a large table there. So let me just show you that. So now I've created some new fixtures here. So this is the product attribute fixture. So you can see that we have two, the woman's shoe size and color. So they are connected to the, they are connected to the value fixture. So here you can see that I've assigned product at attribute one, which was the woman's shoe size. I've connected that up to attribute value five, so shoe size five, and then I've done the same thing here, product attribute one, shoe size six. And then what I've done here is product attribute two. So this is product attribute ID two, which is the color. That's now associated to blue and red. So all that new data is gonna be inserted into a database. So in addition to that, I have also updated the inventory fixtures. And there's quite a lot of data here. So you can see that this is going to go all the way up to uh, around about 33,000 products in the product inventory fixture. So I've gone ahead and I basically in Excel, I've created this, um, all this data. I've just extended and added some new tables, uh, some new fields, copy and pasting the data that was there just to kind of extend. Now, this could all be done programmatically. Although I'm doing this manual, what I'm trying to do is add some more realistic data. I could just create a script, which will create like millions and millions of uh, data in the database, of course. Um, but I've just chosen to do it this way, just to kind of showcase utilizing fixtures. So next up, we have the inventory. So then we also have the values fixture. Um, so let's have a look in here. You can see this is going to go up to, oh, this is going to go up to nearly 68,000 records. So going back to, going back to our set of table here, that's the product attribute values, what you just saw there. So there's around about 30,000 now here in the product inventory. So remember that's basically two. Uh, sorry, four lots of an individual product. Now, if you're kind of confused at this point, remember, for example, we may have a Nike shoe. That shoe, um, if we're going to stock it, would have different types. So it'd be a red, blue, different sizes. So we'd actually have to store that in our inventory, all these different items. So that's what we've done here. Those individual items are now stored here. Now they have different attributes. Those attributes are defined from the product attribute. So we define the color and the woman's shoe size, for example, in this case. And then we add some values to those attributes, which was shoe size five and six and color blue and red, I think it was. And then what we've done now is we've associated these attributes over to these products. And so that's now generated 68,000 items here in this table. So the maths there is that each item here will have uh, two attributes, the color and the size. So essentially we're just doubling the size of this table. So you can see that this table will get quite large. It's probably one of the largest tables. So because I've added more items in this product inventory table, of course, now I need to record how much stock I have of each item. So I've also gone ahead 
and we can see that in the stock fixture I've now gone ahead and created loads more there and there's thousands there as well so it should be the same amount as what we have in the actual inventory table over 31,000 records okay so quite large data sets currently so something that I've made that we need to now change in the models in the fixtures here in the inventory fixtures what I've done is I've added a new field called is default so what we've got to imagine here is that what we're doing is we're selecting by selecting the product here this particular product there are now four items associated to that product so the question is well what product do I show first now obviously when you go to an e-commerce site you select the product that takes you to the product page and you get shown a product and then you can see all the other sub products that are associated to it so here what we're going to do is we're going to find when we're creating new products in our system we're going to define the, the default product that gets shown first and that's fairly useful because we might want to show different products um, the default product for different items in our inventory so this this is going to allow us so that when we select from the inventory table the particular product we might have six seven eight nine different types of that similar product um, so what we're going to do is just filter that out by adding a is default so that that individual item gets shown first and then we can just select through the filtering option for the different product um, types of that particular product the red item or the green item and so on so that's how it's going to work so that's why we've gone ahead and we've added the is default field so what that means is that we're going to need to go over to the inventory here and inside of our models we just need to make sure we now add that to the let's see product inventory under the I think we've got is active so we can just copy is active and then we can call this is default so this is a new field in the inventory product inventory table so that's going to be is default that's going to be a boolean default is going to be false so someone's actually going to need to specify this so the default is going to be false and then the verbose name is going to be called default selection and then format true uh, equals it's going to say yeah the sub product visible sub product visible so now we have that in place let's just uh double check so we've removed the container so I've gone ahead and deleted the container so we're starting fresh again so let's go back into our shell here and let's just uh, docker compose up so we're just going to bring up the database again and then we're just going to make sure that we have in the migrations here there isn't any migrations this is in our oh no the inventory app migrations so we'll just get rid of that migration so with that in place we should now be able to load our new fixtures so let's go ahead and do that so i think we've got them right here so loading our new fixtures so that's probably going to take a couple of minutes because there's quite a lot of new fixtures there that we're going to need to load in so you can see that all the fixtures have now been added into the project so there's quite a lot of fixtures going on there so let's go ahead now and just run the server see what happens here going back to our products detail page we're going to refresh and you can now see that because of this product we now have four items of this product in our product infantry table and that's obviously the blue size 5 the blue size 6 and then the red size 5 and the red size 6 so you can see that we've got four items here so now we've got an issue with our query so now we need to think about how we're going to create a query whereby we're just going to select one so this is where is default potentially comes in handy because we can now filter out these products and only show the one that's meant to be shown first so let's go ahead and go back into our views 
And what we can do now is maybe just add another filter. So here we're going to add a dot filter. And then this time we want to filter out uh, is default. So is default equals and then true. So what I've done in the data set is I've activated one of the items when I created the fixtures. So one of the four items will be set to uh, is default true. So having done that, let's go back here and refresh. You can see now we're just showing the one item. Now, obviously we are returning the four items and that's good because what we're going to do now is try and create some sort of filter whereby we can select those attributes from those other items and then we can select um, the different products that we want to potentially buy through our filter system. So let's talk a little bit about how this filtering system is going to work. So just to kind of take you through it, uh, what's going to happen is that we're going to pass some values using HTTP GET. So we're going to have, for example, uh, question mark and then key value. So we're going to say here, for example, color equals, for example, red. So we're going to be able to pass values here in the URL and we're then going to be able to capture these values inside of our view. And then, of course, we can then use these values to create some queries to return the item that we want to view. Now, that's what's going to happen here. So, for example, what we're going to need to do here is we're going to need to determine what attributes are associated to this product. That is obviously going to be color and shoe size. So in addition to that, we're also then going to need to find out all of the, the, the different attributes associated to this product in terms of shoe size and color. So that should be, I think, red and blue, five and six. So we're going to need to kind of draw out from the database all the values as well. And that's going to create, like we saw in the preview, a, a list of different values we can select. And then we're going to need to create some JavaScript and attach it to these items, these values here so that when we click on these items that then changes uh, th and sends us to the the correct url and then adds the properties or the attributes here of the products so they then get passed to the view and then in the view um, they can we can then run a query to capture that data and then select the right item and then that would then return refresh the page and return the item that's associated with these attributes here and the actual product name. So we're going to use the attributes, the color and the shoe size, as well as the actual product slug to actually then determine what item to show on the page. So we can see here then in our URL, we're adding some attributes here, color equals red. So we're gonna pass that over to our view. So that's gonna be captured here, or it's gonna be sent in the request. So let's go ahead and create an if statement. So if request dot get so if there are get values then we're just going to print something simple like uh, there, there are values there we go so let's go back here let's just refresh and you can see that they've been captured and it says there are values if we remove these values and then I'm saving it and then refresh Go back, you can see it doesn't say that. So we are detecting that there are some value being passed over and now we want to capture them. So what we're gonna do here, we're going to set up a, let's say filter, um, let's say filter arguments equals and then an empty list. Okay, so we're gonna to need to tab that across okay so we're going to fill up this list here with values that we pass over in our url so let's go ahead now and just create a very simple say loop so for example for value for value in request dot get dot values so we're going to grab the values and then we're just going to loop through them and then we're going to say filter arguments uh, dot append. So we're just going to add to our list the value. Okay, so in this case, we're just going to grab these values. In this case, um, let's just create a few. So color equals red, and let's add a new one. So we need the and, and we're going to now say shoe 
uh, shoe size equals five. Okay, so let's go ahead and just to add a code on there. So we're just gonna loop for all these values and then we're gonna basically just update our list here, append that with the value that's passed in. So in this case, we've got two values here, color red and shoe size five. So we'll just refresh with that. And then we go down and we've gotten to print it out. So let's go ahead and print that out. Do that again. So now you can see we've now gone ahead and we've now captured red and five. So the reason for doing that is that we're going to need to utilize this information in order to kind of build a query. Because for example, eventually we'll build a, a filtering system here so by we can click on five, for example, shoe size five, and then that's gonna update this and send it across to the server, refresh the page and return the right item. And then there'll be an item here, size six, and then the size six will then change here. And then we can then run the query and return the size six version of this shoe. So go ahead and explore this. So what I'm trying to do here is go step by step. And I do recommend if you're new to this to try and maybe just stop, have a look, very simple like W3 schools, for example, and have a look at how to capture these get values. So how to capture an individual value. Um, here is just a method of many methods. I've just tried to simplify it in a way that's very easy to understand potentially. Um, of just capturing those, um, placing those in a list here. But of course, there's many ways you can work with this. So let's see how we can utilize this list now in a query in order to extract the correct item. Right, so let's just take our query here. Um, we've got product uh, slug equals slug. Okay, so that's not a problem at all. So we're selecting by slug. So that's gonna then select the item or the four items that are gonna be then returned and then filter equals, uh, filter equals, sorry, is default equals true. So I'm just gonna remove that for now because um, what I want to do is I want to filter out these four items. So this should be returning four items again. So these are all the different items um, of this particular shoe with all the different attributes. So one of these will be red shoe size five, one of these will be blue shoe size five and so on. So what I want to do now is try and filter that using my new system that I'm designing here. So let's go ahead now and try that. So what I'm gonna do here first is I'm just gonna extend this now and I'm gonna add a new filter. So I'm gonna say filter, okay. So this is where it gets a little bit complicated. So we need dot filter, sorry. Okay, so we're gonna make a filter. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into attribute, attribute um, values, underscore, underscore, and then attribute um, attribute uh, value underscore so in and then we're going to say equals and then up bringing our filter arguments so what is attribute value so let's go back to our models here so the product inventory table so what we're doing here you can see that we've selected attribute value so we're using this many many field to kind of traverse over to the other table so let's just bring back our tables in here so we've got in this table, apologies, not up to date, attribute values in this table. That's what we we're saying. And then we're basically going to basically be selecting um, the values um, from this table. So what we're going to be doing essentially in this query is we're basically going to query from this table and we're going to say select the item in this table where the product attributes equal X and Y. And that's obviously the, the shoe size and the color for example. So we're going to be able to kind of query um, utilizing these tables here by utilizing by utilizing the attribute values. So let's go back in here. So we've got attribute values and then attribute value. So the attribute value is a reference point to uh, this table here. 
and the attribute value. So essentially what we're going to say is select all the items from this table where attribute value equals five and equals red, for example. Okay, so you can see that from our code, uh, we're utilizing these this list here. So we're able to pass in multiple items with this list, hence why I created this list here. So this is holding, for example, red and few size five or, or whatever we um, select from the get values. So let's just give this a go, shall we? So let's go back into um, here. And now we're going to select color red shoe size six. Now we need to be careful here. Um, or we, it doesn't matter actually what what we type here because what we're not doing is we're not actually filtering via the name. We're just utilizing the value, remember? So it doesn't actually matter what we type here in shoe and color. This is just for reference, if you like. So let's go ahead and try this. And you can see that actually uh, nothing's happened at this point. So red and shoe size six. So let's just try and answer the question, why are we still returning four items? Well, we're trying to filter based upon any item that has red an attribute of red and any item that also has an attribute of five. Now there just happens to be four of them because there's two items in the database which has attribute red because we've got the red shoe size five and the red shoe size six. And in addition to that, we've also got two items that has the size of five. So we have the blue item shoe that has a five size five and then we have the red item that has a size five as well. So what we try and need to try and do is we need to try and make a filter whereby we say in actual fact we're looking for the product that has both red and five not any that have red or five but red and five so we're going to need to kind of make a very kind of complicated query now potentially that's going to match the two items and not the one item and that then should produce one item um, on our page so the first thing that we're going to need to do is use annotate and we're going to need to count how many items are inside of our filter here because we want to basically say this item that we're trying to find has both of these attributes so two of these attributes so it must have two of these attributes so what we're going to do is apologies for repeating myself um, we're going to use annotate so i'm not going to explain at this point what annotate is for etc it's just worth going into the Django documentations and doing that. So we're going to use annotate in order to kind of generate a number. So we're going to say number of, let's call these tags um, equals, and then we're going to bring in count. So you can also really see that I've imported that already. I'm just going to leave it here so that we can see that we brought that in uh, for this specific query here. Um, so this is going to allow me to count. So what do I want to count? Um, well, I want to count, for example, the um, attributes, attribute, oh, attribute values. Okay, so come over. Okay, right. So annotate number of tags equals count attribute values. Right. So what's happening there? Well, what I'm doing here, if you imagine this list here. If I were to say to you, which one is, if I counted the attributes, which one is going to match red and five? That's what we're saying. So does this product match? Um, does this have an attribute of red and five? If it does only have one of them, then using annotate there is only going to produce one item or one, basically, it's going to be returned. Now, this item might be here, the product of this shoe that has both attribute red and size five so that's going to return two so we're using annotate to actually calculate based upon the parameters that we've uh, set here red and five we're going to calculate which one of these items has matches the two attributes here of red and five in the database and we're then going to be able to utilize that to make a filter and then just return the one item so now we've captured here two in our annotate, we can now utilize this. Notice here that we created a variable here. So this is going to return one or two. So what we want to do here is we know that this filter argument has two attributes. So let's go ahead and match the filter attributes, the amount of filter, sorry, the amount of attributes in our, in our uh, 
in our list here, which would be two, to this number here. And if we do make a match, that item needs to be printed out. So let's go ahead and make a, a new filter here. And then this filter, we're going to say uh, num tags, num number of tags, that should, um, that should be two, should equal. And then we get the length of our, of our list filter arguments. Okay, so that should match. So num tags equals um, the filter arguments. Right, so with that in play, uh, let's go ahead now and refresh. And you can see we're returning one item. Right, so what we can now do, for example, and remember what we've got here is that um, we've got one shoe that has multiple attributes. So therefore in the inventory table, we're storing a row for every single product that is slightly different, the red shoe, the blue shoe, and so on. Right, so they all have individual SKUs. So individual numbers associated with the product that allows us to uniquely identify that product in our stock room, and that's the SKU. So for example, if I were to now go to shoe size six, you can see the SKU changes and the quantity of this product we actually have also changes, and that's the same we've set up so far in our data red and blue. That's all we've got so far. You can add some more data, of course, and try this out on multiple, but this should be fairly adaptable. So for example, if we had three attributes or four attributes, you can see that potentially, because we're counting uh, the attributes, it should be quite expandable uh, and generic for uh, expansion if we wanted to utilize this. So I apologize for keep iterating over here the same thing, but hopefully this is making sense to you. So we, first of all, we filter out the product by slug that returns four items. We then filter. Okay. So we look at the attribute values underscore attribute value in filter arguments. So we match all the products um, that have whatever the um, attributes here, red and shoe size. So that then returns all the products based upon that filter there. So that still returns four items. So like I explained before, there's gonna be two blue items and two size fives. Uh, so it's always gonna return four. So what we do here is we say annotate number of tags equals count, and then we um, associate that to the attributes values. So each item that gets returned here in our filter is going to be associated to certain values. And what we've done here is we're saying, well, how many value, values are they associated to based upon what's in our list here? So we might have red and five. So all the products that both have both red and five, that's going to return, if we use annotate here, if we count them, it's going to return two or one. So if it just matches, the product matches one item, um, then it's going to return one. If the product matches all the items in this case, both of them, um, red and five, that's going to return two. So we're storing that number here in num tags two, and then we're going to create an additional filter. So we're saying num tags two equals, uh, and then the length of the filter argument. So if we're making a match there, then basically this is where we're going to grab that one item that has both attributes that we've passed in through get here, red and shoe size five, for example. And that then allows us just to return one item. So let's think of annotate as a way of grabbing more information that we might want to generate for this piece of data that we're returning. So annotate, basically imagine if we wanted to collect all the data of an individual product. Great, so we create a query and grab that product. Now we can then use annotate potentially to then create a another query and return that data. And we can attach that data through annotate to the result from the original kind of result from getting the individual product. And that then allows us to add more information uh, to our data here. We can pass that then to the, the front end, for example, the template. So that's essentially what's happening when we're using annotate. It allows us to grab more information which we can add on to the query set, the data that's being returned. Right, so now we've got that, let's go ahead and now think about the next stage. So now we need to concern ourselves with actually working out, well, what actual attributes do these products have for us to actually print out? And this is where the next set of tables come in handy and hopefully this now will make sense. So what we've done here is we've associated our, all of our products to a product type, 
table. So in this product type table, we're just going to have, for example, an ID and name. So for example, um, the product type, let's just uh, actually take a look at this. So in our models here, we're going to have a type table. Uh, let's see if we can quickly find it. I think it's further up top, apologies for scrolling. Um, product type. Okay, I think I've called it product type. Okay, we go for that. So product type table just has name. Okay, so here the name is just going to be the, well, the type of product. In this case, I think in our fixtures, go and have a look. I think our fixtures just has, for example, one type, which is shoe. So the fixtures and then we're looking at type. Yeah, it just has one item, which is shoes. Okay, so we know that's the case. Now, what we're going to do here is create now create this table. Because what we're going to do is we want to collect all the attributes associated with shoe. Now, if you just think about this in kind of a management perspective, like imagine kind of the admin interface for adding new shoes. So, for example, you want to add a new shoe. So you go and select add new shoe. Right, so your system might include multiple items, different types of items, shoes, books, and so on. So we have a product type associated to each of your product types. So imagine in this interface, we're in this interface now, we select add new product, and then we select shoe. So what we want to do at that, that point is we want to then have a nice list where we have shoe name, price, and so on. But in addition to that, we want to be able to add values, or attributes to that product. Now, different products will have different attributes. So the idea of this table here is to load this table up with all the attributes that are associated to that product type. And then of course, multiple product types will have different attributes. And this is gonna allow us then to determine what attributes need to be displayed on the page for people to actually type in for that individual item. So for shoe at the moment, we have product attributes, um, size and color. Right, so that's going to be loaded up in here and associated to the product type so that whenever I want to find out, for example, what attributes are associated to shoes, I can simply just query this table and it'll tell me, oh, if you want to make a new shoe, you've got to have shoe color and shoe size. So before we build this table, there's one other thing to point out that there's a many, we're going to connect it to this table and actually, in fact, not this table here. So there is a many-to-many -many connection between product type and product attribute. So this is a link table. Now this could be generated automatically for us if we just created a foreign key, uh, many-to-many relationship from the product type to the product attribute table, for example. But we're gonna build this manually like we did with the product attribute values. And the reason for that is because we want to add some more items here. So let's again, just imagine what we want this to do for us. So we, again, we go into our admin interface, we add a new product. Now this is a sequence of product attributes. Now maybe what we want to do here eventually is maybe hide some attributes. And in addition to that, we want to sequence them on the page. So potentially we want to move which one should be first, added first, for example. So by adding like a sequence field, which we won't do in this instance, but later on we might include it. By adding a sequence field, we could make an order for our actual attributes to appear on the page when we actually include them. So even if, for example, our actual template um, shows our product and then our attributes, that also allows us to consider, for example, adding some sort of is active type of item here and a sequence. So they appear in the correct sequence you want to show them to the user on the page. So that allows us to kind of add additional additional fields by creating this field, this table, sorry, manually. So let's go ahead and we're going to go into the models in the inventory app here. And we're just down at the bottom here. Um, we're just going to add this new product. It's going to be called product uh, attribute. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> product type attribute, right? Okay, so let's take in models.model. Okay, and now let's just go ahead and just create some product attribute. So this is the first field. And that's going to equal models dot, this is going to be a foreign key. 
This is going to be a foreign key to the product attribute table. Okay, so foreign key. Uh, let's not do that. Uh, product attribute. Okay, so that's the product attribute. Um, let's go for a comma, and then we we'll say related. What's going on here? Product attribute equals more foreign keys. Product attribute comma related related name equals and then we're going to say that will be uh, product we call that attribute so we need to be careful here not to um, duplicate this so related name will be product attributes and then at the end here because it's a foreign key we're just going to set the on delete uh, to that's going to be set to I think we're just using uh, models dot protect on everything so far just for now and there we go okay so next up then we're going to need to make another foreign key to the product type table so product type uh, equals models dot Again, it's just going to be a foreign key, and then we're going to go for uh, product type, and then just same same as normal Re related name. Um, this time we call this product type, and then finally, after comment, you see how annoying this is here. Um, then next up we have on delete equals apologies for these boxes i've not set everything up yet on this machine uh, protect comma okay so that's our second and then we'll just go for a class uh, meta something simple uh, so we're going to say unique uh, together so these items need to be unique together. So we shouldn't have an item in this table, red and five. We shouldn't see that, for example. Uh, so we shouldn't see, um, in this case, it's going to be type and attribute. So they both need to be um, unique. OK. It's getting a bit late to be honest. My brain is... Uh, starting to hurt i didn't explain that at all product attribute uh, and then the other table which is product type okay okay so they need to be uh unique together and then there's going to need to be a comma at the end here maybe um what have i done wrong here um comma product type Comma. Okay. Okay, so I've just missed the double there. So there we go. So we now have unique together, and that now table is complete. We can go ahead and just add some information product type attribute link table. There we go. So this isn't going to work simply by adding this table here. Uh, we're going to need to also now connect this up. So that's going to be done through the uh, product, uh, the type table, sorry. Uh, so let's just go ahead and find the, the product type table. So in here, we're going to now create a, a new field called product type uh, attribute equals model dot many to many so we're just uh now creating our many to many field uh, of course let's just do this uh, many to many uh, field okay so we created a many to many field nest there so that is going to be connected to the product attribute table and then we just need to go ahead and create our related um, related name equals. So we're going to call this product 
underscore type underscore attributes and then finally we're going to say this goes through the product so we're just defining our many-to-many -many relationship and then through is basically just telling us what our uh, link table is so it knows what table to to go through when we're building queries and so on um there's that okay we seem to have a uh, an error here so product attribute is not defined so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to say well no we're going to use the product attribute table so that should already be defined and you can see that it's not um defined it looks like it's going to be defined at the bottom so simply put we just need to uh just need to find it so there it is so we're just going to move this table now and we're going to move this table uh, above the product type table so that we can call it okay there we go and you can see now that um, everything looks okay so i've moved it above the product type table and i've now defined obviously that um, there's a many 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 to many table many many link through through this table over to the product attribute table and we've created a table called product type attributes as our link table so i guess we're going to need to test this out now so let's go ahead and just uh, close delete our container okay and we're just going to go through the process again so let's remember um, the migrations let's get rid of this migration file yep okay and let's just bring up our console. Uh, so let's go ahead again and just uh, set up our database. It literally takes seconds. And now we're going to assume that we can now build our tables. Now, before we build our tables, obviously this new table that we built here is gonna need some data, right? So um, this is gonna be the, uh, the product type attributes table. So in the fixture here, product type attribute, product type attribute fixtures, you can see what I've done is I've associated the product attribute one, which is shoes, to product type one, I think, which is color or, yeah, color in the products type database, attribute database, sorry. And then I've gone ahead and create another one here. So product attribute two is associated also to the shoe product type one. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's just go into um, here. So we're saying that in product type, we have one item, which is ID one and then shoe, for example. So we're saying that in this table, um, shoe, product type one shoe, should be connected to attribute one, which is color, and then also should be connected to um, attribute two, which is, I think, women's shoe size. So we have basically just connected that up here in our fixture. So we need to just make sure that loads in. So go to your load fixtures and we just need to um, call that in. So we're just gonna add a new line here and then just going to name it um, what we need to name it. So we're just uh, rename this. We'll copy that and then we go into our fixtures we we'll replace it with this. So we just copied that down, paste that in. There we go. So now we're gonna also load this fixture in when we create our database. Assuming that's all good and well, let's go ahead and kind of load this all in. So load fixtures. Just bring this across so you can see what's going on. So managed to buy load fixtures. Let's go ahead and load our fixtures. So it looks like we have a problem. Um, which has to be installed. So field specifies a many, many registry model product type attributes, which has not been installed. So if you go back in the code, it's just a typo here. So for example, when we created the through, I added attributes and not attributes. So it's just referencing the wrong table essentially there. So that's the problem. It was good that it essentially just told us here, it specifies a many, many relationship through um, this, but it doesn't exist. So the through, and you can see I've just changed the S there. Right, so we just need to go through the same process again. 
um, probably because we've um, half migrated maybe something here potentially um, so there's no migrations actually so we're probably safe to say that we can go ahead and try and run our load fixtures again and there we go so potentially what we have now is the ability to from the new table that we built the link table the product type attribute table we can then move across to the product type table we can then move across to the product inventory table and then we can move into the product table and we can then utilize that kind of method to match all the products related to that particular slug um, that item and we can then relate that all the way back to the product values because essentially by understanding what product we're working with we can then work backwards to see what type it is and then we can then associate that type to the attribute values in the product attribute value table right and i'm not too sure if that makes sense but let's have a little look at this so we go ahead and we start with the product type attribute table we then go ahead and create a filter so we move across to the product type table and then we move across to the product inventory table. So this is the foreign key connected to uh, this table. And then we move across into the product slug table. So into the product table and then look for the slug. So that's going to equal whatever the slug is being passed in. So at that point, we've grabbed the specific item related to this slug. And then we work backwards, we get the product type, which is going to be shoe. And then essentially we're just matching that to all the items in the product type attribute table. And that's then going to give me a list of all the attributes associated to that particular product. It seems a little bit long winded. Um, so that's how it's going to work. So my next question is, what data do I actually want to display? So we started here, we've then moved across to here, then moved across to here, and moved across to here. We found the product via the slug, and then essentially we're then being able to kind of work backwards and identify what product type that is. And then we're going to display all the items in here related to that particular type based upon the product that we selected via the slug. Now what we want to do, remember this is not connected to this, it's connected to this table here. Um, so what we want to do is we have also want to get the attribute name so we can output based upon this attribute value its name so let's go ahead and do exactly that so again like we did previously let's just do dot values and then in this instance we want to get the at product um, attribute so that's a reference to the product attribute uh, foreign key in the product type attribute values table and then we go back and then we want to grab the name. Okay, so we grab the name and that's what we're going to output, the name. So let's give this a go. Um, I'll just grab that, control C that. So obviously we've got a new bit of data that we're passing in. So we do want to um, pass that through. So we're going to say that uh, in this case Z, we're going to reference it as Z. So we're going to pass that through as well. Uh, let's go back into now our detail template. Okay. Oh, no. Is that right? Yep. Okay. So let's go ahead and just kind of print this out. So there's going to be multiple items here. So we're going to need to loop this out. So this is going to be four. So four um, X in this is going to be Z because the data is in Z. So we're just going to loop that out. And then for each item, we're just going to just output the product attribute name. So let's just give this a go. We'll refresh and nothing is working. So that's because I'm not referencing the actual data X dot product attribute name, of course. So let's just go back in here and there we go. So you can see what's happening here is that I'm returning um, sh woman shoe size color, woman shoe size color. It should be four times because if you look at this here, what we're doing is uh, we're based upon slug again. And remember, we've got four items associated to that slug. Therefore, we're outputting at the moment four times, right? So that's why we're returning four item for lots of um, types here. 
related to the shoe because there's four items that we're collecting via the slug because remember the slug is associated to the product inventory table and obviously there's four items associated to that one product right so we need a way of making kind of it only show one so this is where um, some of the tools we have for postgres database come into play right so what we've got here is a dot um, and let's utilize uh, distinct so basically that's going to only show one item okay so it's not going to duplicate anything so let's go back in and refresh and there we go so we just show one set of outcomes color and woman shoe size so those are the titles of the attributes associated to shoes so what we need to do now of course is we need to grab the attributes associated to this product obviously there's four here we've got blue we've got red we've got shoe size five and shoe size six so we now need to kind of sort that out and put it into the associated um, type fields here so that the attribute fields okay right so let's give it a go so let's just call this uh, x equals and or or y even because i think we've got x I'm too sure okay so we've got y here equals and uh, so we're going to have models uh dot and then product um, we're going to start with like product inventory this time i think okay and then dot objects uh dot filter uh, okay, so first of all, we want to grab all the products. Um, so underscore slug uh, equals slug. Okay, so that grabs all the items in the product inventory associated to the slug, and there's four of them, right? Okay, so uh, next up, we want to only... Yeah, so next up, we're going to use uh, distinct. So well, actually, let's just um, work this out step by step. So comma, um, we're going to say, um, this is going to be Y, Y, okay, comma. So that's obviously at the moment only going to produce um, the four items. So um, let's go ahead now and grab some values. so values um, so what do we need here well, we're going to need for example the attribute attribute values underscore underscore so remember attribute values is a foreign uh, is a main to many um, field inside the product inventory table so we're going to utilize that to move across and get the product attribute name okay so let's get the product um, attribute. Let's get the name of it. Okay, so attribute value. So that takes me to the attribute value table, if you like. And then we're going to get the product attribute. So that's a link, foreign key, I think, to the product attribute table. And then we're going to get the name. So again, it, we're just going from one table into the other table. So we started here. We've then said product type underscore product type. So we're like over here. Uh, sorry, product attribute values underscore product attributes. And inside of here, we've got product attributes. And then we've gone inside of here. And then we've just grabbed the name. So that's how we've moved and got the data over for the name that's associated to product inventory um, item. Okay, so that grabs the pro attribute value names. So let's go back here and then we want to also grab the value right so we need to get the value as well so that's going to be attribute um, values attribute uh, value so we're going to go into the attribute value table uh, values table and then just grab the attribute value so that's going to return would you believe it or not the attribute name and the attribute value for this item in this case there's four items so at this point we're probably going to get four set of the same information right so we passed it over as y so let's go into here and we can go ahead and just uh loop this out right so for um x 
in in this case y let's just uh let's print these out so let's just grab that Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're just going to move those, put that there, and put that there. Okay, so just uh, going to create a list here. So in this case, uh, what we're going to need to do here is a bit long-winded, but it's going to be uh, the attribute values uh, Let's get this right. So it's going to be attribute values. It's a bit of a long winded attribute value, attribute name. Okay, so just here, and uh, this is going to be x. Let's get the the value name, and then let's just go ahead and say uh, colon, and then let's just grab the the value. So we grab the value x dot. Okay, so we're just going to display the name and the value there. Uh, so we press save and then just go back and then we can refresh. And then we get an error here. Can it resolve keyword attribute value in field? Choices are attribute. I've spelt it incorrectly. That's why. So let's go back here. Um, missing a T somewhere. Okay, and obviously my template is going to be wrong too. Okay, so let's uh, refresh that, and there we go. So you can see, like I said, because we're selecting four items again, we're going to get uh, lots of uh, duplicates here. So color red, blue, blue, red. 6565. Five. Now, what we want to do here is use distinct again because basically that's going to take out any duplicates and leave everything else. So that's going to leave us with five and six and red and blue. So that's how we can, that's one way at least, uh, we can filter this out. So in this here, before we grab the values, uh, yeah, before we grab the values, let's say distinct. Um, so we're going to use distinct and that's just basically going to remove the duplicates again this is postgres only so if you try this in sql lite it's not going to work and now you can see that we've got all the attributes associated with this product um, so blue red shoe size five and six so we now know the different um, attributes associated with this product color and woman's shoe size and we also now know the um, attributes inside of these um, attributes types <laughs> okay so we now need to kind of buddy all this up so just for kind of simple implementation uh, let's go ahead and we're going to utilize uh yeah we're going to utilize this here this uh this set tags so first of all what we're going to do is we're going to say for x and y um we're going to print out the product name the attribute name so that's going to be color or woman's shoe size. And then in addition to that, so let's just uh, end this. Okay, so then we have this kind of inner loop here. For each of these attribute names, we're then going to get the attributes associated to it. And obviously that's the value, so we don't need the name. So let's just uh, get rid of that. So we're going to get the value. Now we need to some way of kind of associating um, what value should go into which attribute name. So to do that, let's just create a simple kind of if statement. So um, let's say if, uh, and this is going to be, yeah, if x, if the, if the, the value, Oh, sorry, if the uh, name, okay, so we're going to need the name, so let's just grab this. If the name equals the name of the, if this name here, if the attribute name matches the name 
um, of the original attribute name, then we know that the value should be placed in there. So we're going to say if um, attribute name uh, is equal to this name here. So um, this is uh, this is going to be a bit confusing here because I've got these letters and we've got lots of X's here. Apologies for this. Um, okay, so uh, let's go for uh, X and Z and then let's go for um, A and B. All right, let's just go A and B for now. So we're going to say if um, A attribute values name is equal to X product name, then we're going to do something. So let's uh, end this if down here. Okay. Okay, so we've got the product name, and then we're saying here that if the uh, if the attribute name of this loop here matches the name of the current kind of uh, section that we're currently in, then we're going to output the attribute. So this is a uh, command save that the attribute value. So let's have a look at that. Okay, it's not quite quite working. Okay, so that's not obviously working because I'm not actually selecting the data, right? So this data here, um, this is the, <laughs> the Z data. Um, this is the values. I should have named this more appropriately. I do apologize. So this is Y. So the data is in Y to begin with. I'm going to pass that to A. So let's just print that out. And you can see here now we've got it on the go. So color, um, blue, red, woman's shoe size, five and six. So that allows us to kind of separate the data into the right titles here. Um, hopefully that makes a little bit sense. Have a little read of this. So what we're doing here, first of all, we're looping the outer loop here, which is grabbing the um, product type uh, values, attributes, if you like. So we're gonna print those out. So we get the title name. So that's gonna start off with color, for example. And then we're gonna loop the inner loop. So here we've grabbed all the attributes from the products associated. Um, to the um, the page, which is the, the whatever shoe it is. So in this case, it's this sneaker here. And then we grab the attributes attributes associated to that, and we match the name of the attribute to the um, the name of the current title attribute here that we're trying to collect the attributes about. And then you can see we've just kind of printed those out there. And then we grab the next title um, from the product type value, a woman's shoe size associated to the shoes. And then we just grab those values there um, that have been grabbed from the individual product. And then we loop that out too. So hopefully that makes uh, sense of what's happening in this little bit here. We now have um, all the attributes associated to uh, this product laid out. So now what we need to do is we need to find a primitive way of so that when we come to this page, we can select these items here and then that then changes the page and changes the item. So basically what we need to do is, like we've done earlier, we need to click on one of these and it passes that over to, um, passes it over here to the URL and then it sends it off to the view and then refreshes the page and then shows us the new item. Let's just tidy this up a little bit. So uh, I'm going to create a new uh, list here and then that's going to end okay uh, so that's the kind of outer list and then for this i'm going to make a another list here right so inside of here i'm going to make another list um, cool and then inside of here we're going to create a, a new list item yep like we've got here so let's just uh, try that out there we go. And um, we've got a random, because we've not ended, I bet, one of these items properly. There we go. There we go. So that lays it out a little bit more effectively for now. So at this point, we are now at a junction where we've now completed, if you like, all the um, aspects of the back end that needs to take place at this point. Um, 
what we are going to need to do here in actual fact is potentially we're going to need to run two queries so depending whether or not we've got to that page um, and there is kind of get values so if you think about it so we go to the product page um, and that's going to show at the moment it's not showing anything at all so we're going to need a query that shows one item and then we're going to need also a query um, that when we add some uh, parameters here uh, some attributes and pass them across then we're going to need to show that page uh, separately so potentially there's two queries here that we need to run so let's just uh, separate this so um, we're going to uh, I think we're going to run this because this is our filter when we've added items so if there is a re request here we're going to run this let's just tab this across so if there is um, get information uh, if there is values then we're going to run this um, else we're going to run another query and that's just going to return um, just one item right so let's just grab this data equals filter slug uh, um, yeah I think we're just going to run the slug actually in this case uh, okay and then filter we do want to run a filter if you remember earlier we run a filter and that is going to be um, is default and that's going to show the one item that is the default item to be shown as the first item right so it is true and then in addition to that let's just grab these values because it's going to be the same values that we want to output okay else we're going to run that query so if there is um, values if we have passed over our colors and shoe size etc we're going to run this query else we're going to run this query here so let's just uh, do that and you can see that this is like the home page for the product a single product and you can see it does still show me all the attributes um, but uh, I've just got the default item and of course now what I can do is uh, go over to like color equals red and 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 shoe size equals six and you can see now i'm showing a different item you can see the sku has changed move back and there we go right so we've clearly got to um got that sorted so yes now we have the back end sorted now we need to go to the front end and think about a little bit of javascript here um to basically allow us to click on these here and then this, ooh, update um, our request with the values send it across to the view and you can see the view is working already when we pass parameters across so that's going to show the new item so think about what we need to do next let's think about this logically what do we need to achieve so we have this product detail page and we enter this page and currently this is the the default option so is default option so I think the first thing that we need to do is identify what is the default option. Is it blue five or blue six or red five or red six? So let's go ahead and ensure that the user lands on the product detail page. It shows the default product. And then it also then shows the option of that default product. So currently we return this product and currently the query that returns this product doesn't actually return the actual attributes of this product. So what we need to do is manipulate or change this query so that not only we return the product detail information, but this product detail is returned in addition to the actual attributes that are associated to this particular product. So let's go back into the code. We're going to need to go into the view. So this is the, the default query, if you like, if it's the default product. And then of course, if we do pass any values, we're then going to use this query to output the product. So we're going to need to manipulate this query here first. So if you remember earlier, what we did, we used annotate to add additional information to the query. So let's use annotate again to do exactly that again. But this time we're going to use annotate to add some additional attributes and that's going to be the attributes values that are associated to that individual item that we're trying to output so let's go ahead and do that so let's go ahead and 
just add a, a new annotate. So we can do that, for example, after the values here. So we want to add some more data if you like. So dot annotate. Okay. So here, what we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to give it a key if you like. And we can use that key then in the output in our template to actually access this data. So I'm just going to call that, for example, I don't know, field A for no particular reason. You can call it whatever you like. So field A, for example, equals. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to return essentially an array, if you like. So we can use, uh, for example, the, which is a very kind of specific tool utilized, only available in Postgres database, ArrayAg. So this was just an excuse to show you a page which probably isn't very um, popularly, uh, popularly accessed, um, the Postgres SQL specific aggregation functions. So again, you'll probably find, and maybe you already know, different ways of performing this type of query. So we're going to use ArrayAg, and you'll notice that there are different um, variants of this. Um, so we've got JSON ARAG, if we want to return JSON. Um, array if we want to return uh, a string for example we've got string act so that's essentially just defining what we're going the format or type of our data so in this case array act uh, that returns a list of values right so that's what we're going to be returning and that's why we're using array act here right so by all means go and have a little read of this and you can then um, follow some examples and maybe you want to output some or you want to kind of utilize this page to output your data in a different way. Right, so with that in mind, let's go back here. So ArrayAg, and then what we're going to do here is we're going to define um, the data we want to create in our list. So um, let's grab some data. So attribute uh, values. So remember in the product inventory table, we have attribute values. That takes us to the attribute values table. And what we want to do is get the attribute values for this item that we're returning. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. So in the, through the attribute values field, we then go into that table and get the attribute value. Okay, so we're gonna extract the attribute value um, from the attribute values tables associated to this one item that we're returning. So you can see that it's causing an error here because we haven't imported this in. So I'm just going to do it here. You would probably do this in the top, right? Uh, import these resources in, but I'm just going to do it here so you can see this django.contrib. And then we go into the Postgres tools and we want the ag aggregates. And then we want to import uh, array ag. There we go. Okay, so that's that tool imported so we can start utilizing it. And then in addition to that, what we're going to do, um, let me just show you what's happening here. So let's go ahead and just print. Um, we're going to print data. Okay, so let's get back into our website here. Let's just refresh. It's going to cause an error. Okay, no problem. Um, let's just bring up the console. Um, reference before assignment. So I apologize, you can see what's happening here. I'm importing it in here, but we're assuming it's in the for, in the if for loop here, sorry, in the if here. Um, so it only will be initiated if there are values that we're passing in. So let's go ahead and just take that out of there. I'm just gonna put that here um, again. You're gonna put this in the top, but I just wanted to leave that there so you can see what's happening. So we import that in, and then let's just give that a go very quickly. There we go. So now the page is working. You can now see what I'm doing here is I'm printing out um, what's being returned. And you can see what I'm returning here is a query set. Right. So what we can do here, if sometimes this just makes it easier for us to work with the data, is when we utilize get, for example. So currently then we, uh, sorry to repeat myself if I've done that. So you can see that by utilizing uh, 
essentially filter, it returns our query set here. Now we are just returning one item or we're expecting to return one item. So in actual fact, by using get here, it allows us to uh, for a little bit of error control. So if we don't return any data, it will, it will cause an error. So we can control um, error control um, within our data, <laughs> within our code, sorry. Uh, so let's just try it with get and see what we return. Uh, just to see that the difference is so we refresh again um, you can see that in actual fact that's not working very well but let's go back here and you can see now we printed out the data here. it's just returning one item so we are returning the the same data um, but it's just going to be as well format is slightly different so potentially we're going to access it slightly differently and you can see here in actual fact um, that I think we've still got our loop in place here, so we don't necessarily need a loop now. So whereas if we return a query set, ultimately we're gonna access that data potentially through a loop, we don't need to, because we know we're only returning one item. So we're using get here to kind of format that and to allow us to potentially um, control the flow of our data and control any errors that might occur if an item isn't returned from the query. So let's go back into the product detail section here. So now what I'm saying essentially is I don't need to now create this loop here because I can just access the data directly. So let's go back into our code. We can see that it's been returned as data. So that's the data. So I just need to now say, well, just data. So X is not required. So let's just return data. Data, keep typing in date, data. And I did it again, there we go. So who, let's go refresh. And you can now see, I can access that data directly. So there are some details here and it's well worth just typing into Google, filter versus get, just to get some background reading um, on that if you're interested. Uh, but you can hopefully see, I just wanted to really to highlight those differences. Maybe you, want, you know you're going to return just one item, that's gonna help you ultimately as you expand your code and uh, provide some uh, error checking aspects to your code potentially um, and also you can see how that's going to affect the outcome returning just one item we don't need to loop through the data whereas we might need to do that with a query set right so now we've got that in place you can see straight away that our um, new annotate is working because it's returning five and red so you can see that we are getting from our product the different uh, data um, attributes that are associated to this product. And you can see that that's then gonna be referenced via field A. So we're gonna be able to loop through this and output it or utilize it now on our page. So now we're able to actually access the values associated to this individual product. We can now start thinking how we're gonna use it. So what we want to do now in actual fact is loop through this data and where we can make a match between the data here the values and this, we want to kind of highlight these so that the user knows when they, when they land on this page, what this product represents. It represents the color, in this case, it represents color red and five. So you want to get that highlighted on the page and then we can start thinking about how we can then swap that over. So when we click blue, it then goes to the blue product. So let's get this going. So we're going to get rid of this print. We don't need that anymore. Hopefully you get the general idea of what's happening there. So let's go into our product detail. So we've got the top component here, which just returns the current product. And then this bottom component here loops out the different attributes. Right, so here then. So what we're gonna need to do, I think, uh, when we loop out, so remember what's happening here. We've got the attribute name here. That's uh, these uh, names here, color and woman. That's what's being woman shoe size, that's what's being outputted there. And then we've got the internal loop here, which is this loop here, which is looping out the different attributes. So what we wanna be able to do here, I think, is we want an if statement. So I think that after we've checked to see if the attribute equals the attribute name, uh, and, and then starts to add the attribute, I think what we need to do after that is then actually add a, we, we then want to create another if statement, I think, um, after that, to then check to see if the current attribute that we're looking at here matches an attribute that's in our product. And if it does, we want to make it bold. Right, so let's do it. So if 
So we're going to say if a dot, um, this is going to be attribute value, attribute value. So this is the actual value that's currently activated or selected to be printed out. So if that, and we're just going to say in, uh, and that's going to be, uh, let's uh, see what we're returning. So we, we want to um, want to grab this data here, this annotation data here, annotate data here, and that's being returned in data. So you can see that's being returned in data. So I'm going to need to access that through data. So let's do that. So data dot, um, and then we called it field. So we're going to look inside of our, we're going to look inside of our list where this data is. And we're going to say, if this attribute is inside of our list, then what we're going to do is we are going to highlight we're going to, yeah, we're going to highlight the attribute. So we're going to print out the the attribute name like we do normally. But this time, uh, we're going to use a class equals. So we're just going to use some bootstrap here. So we're going to say class equals, and then let's go for uh, bold. So can I remember how to make this bold? Yep. Yeah. Okay, I think it's uh, FW bold. I apologize, I wasn't talking to you then. I was talking to myself, so that's bold. Cool. Right. Um, then we're probably going to need an else. Um, end if. So before the end if, let's do else. Else, we just want to print it out normally. Right. I think that's going to be the case. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. So you can see what's happening here. So let's go and just uh, indent that. So if the attribute name equals the current attribute name that's being um, looped through, then we're going to then print out the attribute. So we're going to then first of all check to see if the current attribute that's going to be outputted is the same or can be found in the annotation data based upon the, the product that's currently active. If it is, then we're going to make it bold, the attribute of bold. Else, we're just going to print out the attribute. So let's just give this a go, see if it works. Doesn't look like it does. Okay, so let's have a look at the code here. So um, let's just make sure this is right. So this is data. So we're passing that back as as data. So this is a type of situation where we kind of just need to work backwards a little bit. So let's just print out again data just to make sure that the data is being returned i think that's the first thing so we're running this query so let's just make sure that we're running and returning our field a aggregate data so let's just go back and uh, refresh so you can see here that we are so in field a we have five and red okay so those are the, the two uh, data attributes that are being returned for this product so i think we can be safe uh, in that that is actually happening So let's go ahead and let's just print this out. So uh, let's say uh, data field A. So we'll just go ahead and refresh that. And you can see that we are returning five and red. So to access that data, it's definitely data.field A down here. So we're pretty comfortable about that. So now I'm thinking maybe this class is incorrectly. So let's just type something random there. So if that works, then we know that this if statement uh, returned true. So let's just go back here and refresh. So you can see that actual fact, it looks like it's working okay. So it looks like potentially that, um, it looks like potentially that this isn't working correctly. So maybe our bold class isn't working correctly. So let's go ahead and just take this out of the link here. We're going to bring this down and um, we're going to put this into a separate container. So div class equals. I think I've already done that. Class equals that. Okay, so let's just go ahead and finish that. Let's go back. Okay, so we still don't have bold. And then it just hits me. Okay, so the reason why this isn't working because we haven't extended from the base yet. 
So like, for example, the index, we extended from the base. Uh, and remember, the base actually had the bootstrap CSS. So in base here, we had the link to the CSS for bootstrap, as well as the JavaScript. So that's what's happening here. Apologies. Um, so we worked this out. So let's go back up the top here. Let's just make this sure it extends from base. And that's going to bring in all the CSS. And so when I refresh now, it doesn't work at all. Right. That's because, um, come on. Okay, that's because obviously I need content, right? So let's uh, create a new block. Let's call this content. Um, let's not forget we need that. So these are just skills that we learned earlier. Okay, so that needs to go into the content. And then hopefully now, and there we go. So we've highlighting here red and five. This is the attributes of this current product. So now we're on the last phase. Right, so now what we need to try and achieve is that we want to now select one of these options and then that takes us to the new product via sending parameters here through the URL to the view. The view then utilizes those to select the specific product based upon the parameters that we pass in and then we can see the new product. So we should be able to select any of these and it takes us to that product. Good, right, so that's the next step. So. Um, this is how we're going to do it. Now, I apologize for not having document here or presentation just to take you through it visually, but let's just kind of work this out. So what's going to happen here is that when we load this page, what we want to do is we can see that we've highlighted the current product. We want to select red and five. So we're going to put that in a list. So we're going to grab the current products values, red and five. So we're going to put that in a list. And then what's going to happen is that we're going to select the color or a, another shoe size. That's going to update that list. And then we're going to use that list to generate or create a new URL, which is then going to be um, fired off. And then that would take you to that page. And obviously that then includes the, the values of the item that we selected. So color equals blah and blah equals blah. Yeah. So it's going to include that. And then that's going to take us to this page here. We need to update this in a second. So that's just because we're using, uh, we haven't selected get for that. We'll do that in a minute. So JavaScript is going to generate a URL like this when we select one of these items. And then it's just going to fire off, uh, send it to the view. That's going to then run the query and return the individual item. So that's the idea. So just to reiterate, apologies for repeating myself, but what's going to happen here is that we land on the default page. Okay, so we then select blue. What's going to happen behind the scenes when this page loads, we're going to record the current items values. We're going to store that in a list, for example. So when a user selects blue or six or whatever, what's going to happen? It's going to update that current list with a new item. And then we're going to use that list, that list to then create a new URL and we're going to get the current URL and then we're just going to extend that and add the new values based upon what the users clicked and then that's going to fire off to the view and then return the item. So that's what we're going to be doing next. So let's go ahead and try and achieve this. Right, so we need to know a few things potentially. So we need to know, for example, what items are currently selected. So for example, here, this item here is currently selected because it's in bold. So let's give this a new class of also selected. And we can then utilize that to actually select the items on that page that have been selected. We can use this class to actually select this value. And of course, the values that aren't selected, they don't get this class. So that is a way of then just us selecting the values that have been or do have the class selected associated to it. Okay, so that's the first thing. So secondly, potentially, um, in order for us to do that, we're going to have to grab all values um, in all values that are currently printed. So let's go ahead and give us an ID. So we're going to say ID equals, and then for example, target, uh, and then let's just give it, oh, apologies. Let's just, um, let's just go ahead and say a dot attribute values which one we got yeah this one this one here so that's going to output the name 
um, the attribute value, sorry, that's going to attribute red or the number, for example. OK, so that's an ID. So I can use this ID to then actually um, select this item and then we can do something with it. So let's go ahead and just add this ID down here in our list item. Uh, so let's just uh, do what we did previously. So let's just put this or wrap this in a div. Maybe it just makes it a little bit clearer. Um, first of all, let's just wrap it. And then let's go ahead, add that in. OK, so let's just uh, see what's happening here. So let's go ahead and access the the win develop and then we'll access the show page source. So you can see here in the source, we go down a little bit here. If you can just see that it now says target red. This one's target five, this one's target six. Um, so you might just be able to see that. I don't seem to be able to kind of zoom in. Uh, apologies. Uh, so you can see that that's what we're adding to the ID here. This one's selected, it's bold, and that's five. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little sense. So let's add some more metadata to this. Let's go ahead and just view. Um, let's just uh, let's go ahead and add, for example, a value. So we've got ID, we've got class. Okay, so ID, and this one doesn't have a class. And let's go ahead and add. Yeah, I'm just really kind of going through the motions here of adding some kind of metadata here. So let's go for, for example, uh, data attribute. So this is just another way of us adding more data or other ways we can kind of capture data. Um, so we're going to say here, this is going to be, this is going to be the product uh, attribute name. OK, so that's going to be the name. So we've got value and we can also then select the name of this attribute based upon this block here. And then let's also go for value. So this is just another way of us to add some more data. So we're going to say value equals and then that's going to be a dot attribute value attribute value. OK. So let's go ahead and add that value. Uh, the, sorry, the data attribute and the value. Let's just add that also into the top option here. Um, just right here. There we go. And that's before we output the item or the, the value. So maybe you can see in the source now we have, for example, the target, blue, ID, attribute, data attribute, color, value. Uh, you can see that that hasn't actually been outputted. So that is something that we need to change. So this value hasn't been outputted. Um, so let's just make sure we've got the double curlies at the front and then also at the back here. So let's go ahead and do that. So at the front there and then at the back here. Um, just make sure we put that in the right place. Yep. OK, so let's go back here. We'll refresh. And you can now see that we have the data color, color, value, red, and so on. So you can see that we're just passing data in. The whole point of this, if you're not familiar with using JavaScript and CSS and HTML, is we're just adding metadata here. And we can then utilize it. We can extract this data. And this would be valuable when we kind of make JavaScript in a little bit uh, to understand what data that we're currently working with. So we can kind of select this block here or this piece of data via the value or the data attribute and so on. So this is all going to be interesting information that we're going to need. So we're going to need the color. We're going to need the value, which is, for example, red. And that will then help us, like I said, create some if statements and conditional statements and so on for us to select the right items on the page. So now it just happens that every time there's a bit of data 
um, being outputted a value or an attribute sorry being outputted then it has an id of target and then whatever the attribute is so we can now go ahead and extract all of these values and get them ready uh, to be placed in a list for example or in a dictionary or an array um, with javascript so via the the target name so because these targets they do change name but what we can do is we can just take the uniqueness um the the commonness the commonness we can take the column ele common element which is target dash and we can loop through this whole page and we can extract values based upon the id starting with target dash so let's go ahead and type in script okay and then let's go ahead and create this uh this Va variable and uh, let's just call it for example text boxes i don't know why text boxes um so that's where the text is we could have called them values um equals document so we're going to go into the document we're going to use a query selector selector and then all and then what we're going to do is we're going to look for um the data where the id so we're going to say id um, all anywhere equals target. Okay, so basically wherever the id of target is, we're going to collect that data and we're going to put it into this variable here. So you can see that it starts target. We could say target dash, for example, um, if we wanted to, but that's basically going to select all these uh, elements here with uh, where it starts id target and that's all of the items here five six red and blue so now what we want to do is we want to loop through this and select only the items uh, that have been or that have been selected so we know which ones they they are because they have the class selected so what we can now do is loop through this um, new array where we've collected all these data and we can then filter further and only then select the items that have the class equals selected in it which would be red and five and it's actually actually that that we're going to store uh, so let's go ahead and do that now this is a little bit um, not how you want to do it but let's start with e so e equals zero and then we're going to say let um let for example f equals text uh, boxes so we're going to get the length um, of this text box so this should be four um four now, there should be four items in here so let's uh, say so text boxes dot uh length so the reason i'm doing it this way is because um i couldn't quite work out um how to uh how to troubleshoot an error um, so basically i'm just going to loop through it and i'm just controlling how many times i'm going to loop through this now please if you um, have a better succinct solution just let me know and i'll copy it in so for uh let i in text boxes i presume so um for i in text boxes so we're going to basically um now loop through all the data here so what the current data in here and you can just go ahead and console log this out basically what's being stored is all of these uh, div div information here and basically we're going to go into this information and then we're going to look for where class equals selected so for uh i in text boxes let's just go ahead now and loop so basically what we're going to say first of all is if um if e is less than f so basically what we're going to do is we've stored we start e with zero and f is the length of the text boxes so there's four items currently in there because there's four items that have the id target something on the page so four so we're basically just going to loop around this four times so we're going to loop around uh, each item that's currently being stored and then when we do that we're going to say if the uh, text boxes um the current item um if the class list dot contains 
if it contains a, a selected so those are the ones that we've kind of highlighted as selected so in this case red and five so here you can see five it has class selected apologies if you can't see this i can't zoom in but it says selected there and this one doesn't because it's not currently selected so we're going to grab that so if we do find the one that's selected uh, let's go ahead and do something so we're going to basically put this in a a new variable here so let's create a new variable uh, and let's go as d equals there we go right so we're going to store it so d um text boxes and then i uh, dot and it's going to be what get attribute and then we want to say data attribute okay so we're going to get the data attribute so what does that refer to data attribute we well, can see here it says data attribute and this is going to be the name so it's either woman shoe size um, or it's going to be color so this is why we're adding more metadata here in the div so we can grab this so uh, this item here is referring to the shoe size this item here is referring to the shoe size look up here this is re referring to the data attribute color so that's just going to grab that so what we're doing um, because we're creating a key value pairing here and we're storing that in d it means that we're going to need the key and the value so this is going to be the key which is going to be color for example and then we want to add the value so after this we've got the key and now we want to add the value so if we say text boxes the current item uh, dot get attribute and that's going to be the value so let's just grab the value now so remember the value um, here is red the value here is five and so on so this is the other piece of metadata that we added to our html so that we can start to store data and extract it in this case so that we can create a key value pair and store it so what's happening now then um well let's finish this value um uh, so we're going to say that and then um for if so if there else so once it's finished let's just go ahead and break so we're just going to break that loop um, and then after that we're going to then just increment e so basically when e meets four basically just going to stop okay so that's just going to loop for all the data that's currently in the text boxes remember so for every item we're going to basically do that where the class list contains selected so that's going to be two items so what we have now is in d we're now storing two key value pairs um, we're going to store color in this case red and then women's shoe size five so that's what's going to be currently stored in d and we can check that out um, so for example down here we can say uh, oh yeah just here console.log and then that's going to be d so by doing that and then just refreshing I then go into the console and i've actually never used <laughs> the console here in safari so um I was just expecting that to appear, of course. Um, of course, it would help if the code was in the right place, right? So let's go ahead and just, uh, we're going to select our code here. And then we're just going to bring it in the block. We haven't actually included it in the block here yet. Right, so doing that, let's refresh the page. And you can now see um what's actually being saved and apologies again for not being able to zoom in um i will get that sorted um so color red color red woman's size shoes blah blah blah. so you can see that it's been added there right so everything seems to be working okay at the moment so we now have stored here in d we now have is uh color red woman's shoe size five so so now we have that stored what we're going to need to do now is create some sort of click function so that whenever someone clicks on blue red five or six it then updates um, that data and then we can then use that data to create our new url send us over to that page and then it will display that new product and then we're done right so let's go ahead and do that all uh, right so there's two ways of doing this now we are utilizing here in the base 
we are utilizing it looks like um or not we're using the min bootstrap so uh we could use jquery here um to run this but let's just go for a really kind of basic i'll give you the jquery code you're going to need to bring in jquery so let's just head over to code.jquery.com for example and you can see here this is going to show us all the cdns so i think that we'll just go for a slim here and then we can basically just copy this this is 3.6.0 uh, slim so oh, we can just copy it let's go back into our code let's just uh, add it right here okay so that's jquery um so we can now kind of utilize jquery to create simpler javascript if you like but i'll show you both ways so let's go ahead back and save that view let's go back here into our code right so now we like i said we need to make a click function so we need to detect the fact that someone's clicked on one of those items and then we're going to update our data and then we're going to create a new url and that's then going to forward the user to that new product well, that's the the plan at least right so uh, let's get this started so document i say so a lot okay just add uh, event listener so we're going to use uh in this case we're just going to use javascript so document dot add event event listener so we're going to um uh, listen for the click so when someone's when someone clicks so we're going to create a function okay right so we've got a function um so let's go ahead and define that so let's say let uh, value equals e target dot get attribute so what we're going to do here is we're going to get the value right so what we're doing here let value so let value um, so we're going to have a new variable here value and that's going to store um, the attribute the get attribute uh, we want to store the value attribute so going back to our code here again let's just close this and then let's just open up our code what we're going to do is we're going to when someone clicks here for example what it's going to do that one's blue so we're going to get the value so that's blue so when we click here we're going to capture the value blue which this refers to right so we're going to store that in value so now we're storing in value blue right so that's the first job and now we we'll go ahead and update our data so in d so e dot target um, dot get attribute uh, we're going to get the data attribute okay so we're now looking at our target and we're going to get the data attribute now what's in our data attribute uh, attribute um, so let's go back here in our data attribute remember we're storing the name color so basically we're just going to match make a match in our d variable so we're going to look for where the color equals color and then we're going to update it with the new value so if for example it was um the woman's shoe size we would look inside of d find woman's shoe size and we'd update it with the new value so essentially we're just updating um, the data that's currently stored here in d so that's what we're doing we're just going to update it so we're going to get the um, the data attribute that's being clicked on and update that we'll make a match and update that and then we're going to then let's get this right um, so that's going to equal e dot uh, target get attribute value so we're going to update the value in d where the data attribute equals whatever's data attribute is of the item that we clicked so for example we click on blue this is uh blue we grab the data attribute color we then go into our d data and then we look for color and then we're going to update it with the new item that we've clicked on in this case the value which is going to be blue right so hopefully that makes sense uh, so here we're going to say value so that updates it 
Okay. So uh, now we've done that, let's go ahead now and build a new URL. So let's say let uh, query string equals, and then we're going to build URL URL um, with parameters, right? So we're going to build a new URL with parameters, and we're going to say D. Okay, so we're going to pass in D, and then that's going to be a function that we're going to build in a minute that actually kind of manages and does that. So let's go ahead and build that function. So let's just double check that. Let's just put that there. Okay, so let's build a new function. Uh, this is going to be called build URL params. So we're going to pass in um, our data. Okay, um, then we're going to then essentially just build this. So we're going to say var search params so we're going to grab that data search params oh sorry we're going to create and we're going to build and then we're going to store um, the output in search params because what we're going to do we're going to loop through this data now what we're passing in obviously is d which is currently storing color equals whatever and shoe size equals whatever so there's multiple items in there so what we're going to need to do is loop through and then create our URL. So for um, var d in data, so data is what we passed in. So for each item that goes into d, and then we're going to say search params dot push. So we're going to update search params here with our new data, and then we're going to say d, which is the current piece of data, plus equals plus uh, data D. Okay, so then we're going to return. So we're going to return that data back over here. So return search params dot join. Um, so we're going to join it all together. Um, if there is any with an and. Okay, so what you can do here is use a console dot log and then just kind of um, have a look at all the data that's being currently utilized if you're not too sure what's going on here so essentially let's remember what we're trying to build is we're trying to loop through our data and we're, there, we're trying to essentially say color that's the value then equals and then the value that's what we're trying to build and then of course for each item we then add an and and then add the next value a param value name size and then that equals size and that equals whatever it equals so that's what we're trying to build here so you can see that d plus equals so plus is the concatenator right so d not plus as in add it together it's concatenator so d the value in d currently and then equals plus data d now what is the difference here d and d so remember this is a key value here that we're storing in d so d here is referring to the key and data d is referring to the value so you can see what we're putting together if, for example, D was currently storing um, color equals, um, so color colon one, or red, sorry. If that was just storing that, essentially what we're doing here, we're getting the key of it, which is going to be color, and then the value is going to be red, for example. And then we're putting the equals in between it. So what gets returned here is going, is going to say, in, in simple terms, it's going to say color equals red. And then what we're doing is we're adding that all together with join. Um, uh, in search params, yep, uh, dot join with and, and then we're essentially just returning. Right, so and with that done, we've now returned that data here in query string. Cool, so now what we need to do is say let uh, URL equals, so now we're actually going to change and send the user off to this new location. So we're going to say location dot href um, dot split so what we're doing here window location so what we're going to do is we're going to get the current location and then but we're going to split it where this is so for example if we're on this page here we're basically going to split so we're going to basically take that away we're splitting it there and we're just going to grab that whatever it says there and then we're going to add some new um, parameters to it our new set of parameters right here 
So that's what we're doing here. So basically, um, we're going to look for that. We're going to split it and that's going to get the URL. So that's the, the first part of the URL that we're collecting, utilizing split there. And then we're going to need zero. OK, so we split it. Now what we need to do is say we want to set it now to window. We want to send window.location um, href equals. And that's the URL. That's what we just kind of collected there. So the URL is just holding this first part here. And then we want to then add. So concatenator um, question mark and then the query string that we generated. OK, so now we basically if you just console log that out, if you put that into a variable and console log that out, that now is the new URL that we've just built. Cool. Right, so let's go ahead and comma there, uh, false, and then finish that off. So let's just put it on the same, false, yeah, there we go. Right, so let's go and have a look. So we're going to refresh, I'm going to click on this blue, and you can see what's happened now. I've taken to color blue, woman shoe size, shoe size equals five. So let's go down to six, I'm going to click on six. And now you can see we've gone across to uh, women's shoe size six only. Ah, OK, so potentially there's an error here because it's only returning that. Let me just close this down. Let's have a look to see what's going on. So first of all, let's just uh, let's just fix this here. So let's go back into our code. Now, remember what we did here. We returned one item and we use get. So all we need to do here in our in our query, which we run when there are values being passed through, then we just need to also use get here and that should resolve that little problem. So now we're returning an error. So this is um, the thing. So it actually returned two items. And the reason why it did that because our, our parameters isn't correctly created. So let's go for blue. So you can see here we have now color equals blue and when shoe size equals five. And then let's now select red. And you can now see we've got a problem because it just says color red. So clearly, 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 clearly um, there is an issue here that we need to fix. So let's see if we can work this out. Now, this is um, fairly tricky to work out. So uh, bear with me here. So I had a little think and I think what the problem is here is we haven't actually used annotate on the top query. I think that's what the problem is because we're not returning this selected item, for example. So what we're going to need to do is let's just go ahead and just copy from annotate to get in the lower query. And let's just add it here. Uh, yeah, let's just add it here. And so then we're returning now also the individual item with all the attributes. I think this is what the problem is. So let's go ahead and just go back to our main. Let's just go back to our our root, our default item. So that's been OK. That's displayed OK. So let's go to blue. OK, so you can see what's happening now. Uh, we had this area error earlier, so I'm just going to make this uh, global now. Let's just go to the top, uh, make that global. OK, and I'll do the same thing with the count. So we add that at the top as well. So hopefully we understand that. Um, yep, so let's just remove that. OK, so let's go back now and refresh. Let's try blue again. And there we go. So now we have blue shoe size five and now we have six. There we go. So color blue woman's shoe size six. You can see it's working OK. There we go. So we have a very simple filtering system. You can see that the SKU is changing to reflect and the quantity of items for this particular um, parameters or attributes about this shoe. We can see the current stock that we have available of it. So this is just a demonstration. Now, this code isn't going to quite work very well because, for example, if I click here, you can see anywhere I click on this page, the click function is being initiated. So I just wanted to just wanted to basically show you in simple terms how that might work. Oh, OK, let's just uh, go back. Not too sure what's happening there. So yeah, I just wanted to show you in basic terms um, how that might work. And you can see that is working. Um, so there is a, a different solution. Maybe you want a kind of a jQuery solution. So I've simply just left that um, in the code for you, in the GitHub repository for you to have a look. 
so if you remove this piece of code here and then let's just comment this one out so this is just a this is just a jquery version uh two comments yeah let's just uh, tab it on a little bit so actually this should this should work just the same so let's just uh, refresh the page and let's click on blue so you can see that's working but this time you can see wherever i click in actual fact um it's just associated to these items so the problem here with this piece of code is it just says document so i've not actually connected the click listener to any um to any id for example whereas here you can see that i've selected the ids and i've selected um sorry the click function to be associated to only these um blocks with the id equals target so that's the difference here so that's the example like i said it's in github and you can now go ahead so this should be quite scalable so if we did have more parameters sorry attributes for your product and uh, the way that we've coded this out it should be fairly scalable um, so it should work if you ha added more um, attributes and hopefully you can get a, a general overview now of how you might utilize some more advanced queries to access what might look like a quite complex um, data set um, but essentially, hopefully, this kind of simplistic approach um, and examples may help you further understand how to select data from the database. Of course, again, this isn't anything about performance here. We've not really considered performance, sorry, here. Um, there's a whole host of other kind of tools that we have available in Django to potentially improve the performance um, of some of these queries. I just wanted to make it as simplest in the simplest way as possible so go ahead and have a look at the repository i probably would have tidied up the repository slightly so for example the template here might look slightly different uh, to the one that we've developed so far i've just added some different divs just to make it look a little bit uh, more pleasing uh, easy to understand hopefully but yeah that is all the code for this tutorial so to finish off let's just say what we have now is a demo app and that's exactly what i wanted to build and what we've done also is that we've now initiated uh, a thought process by going through the basic uh, views and thinking about some of the different templates we were able to actually extend our database we would at, we were able to kind of validate the data in the database and whether it was feasible to kind of store the data in that way in order to perform some basic functions that we might want to use in our actual application so hopefully that was useful and you can kind of see by making these simple prototypes it allows us to explore the data more and possibly see where potentially our fields more fields are required and where our design may fall down or where it needs to be extended and to help us improve our application so what we can now do probably is to take the fixtures in the inventory and they are essentially now associated to the demo app more than the actual inventory app because what we want to do in in later tutorials we will want to then create some more demo apps and to explore some other aspects of this application which we might want to develop So take, for example, the next tutorial where we start to develop a recommendation system. We can just make an app called recommendation system and then we can add some different, for example, fixtures that we might want to only associate with that particular kind of demo aspect of our application, a recommendation system. So that can be very useful working in that way. In addition, what we have done is we've kind of made a base. This infantry app now is a base application uh, which we don't need to necessarily make any more changes or effects. So for example, if we had all the demo code, the templates, etc., inside the inventory, that could then um, prevents potentially us to kind of explore and to make other apps on top because we already have that code now kind of embedded into that area. So this just allows us to kind of decouple some of the aspects of our program to help test and develop our program more effectively and to maintain a core application 
here in the background by not having to then make any changes to the core application because I can just now delete demo and then we still have the core application. So hopefully that makes sense and that is useful in your thought process when you're developing your application. So thank you very much for listening. This was Queries and Filtering Products. Hopefully um, I covered everything that I was intended to cover. Um, so for example, uh, for ex I haven't mentioned SQL join. So I was going to go into a little bit more detail uh, and give you some more information about and explore the SQL joins. I was also going to talk a little bit about, um, I think here we were going to implement tools to help monitor and view queries. So that was something else we haven't done. I think there's quite a lot here and I did want to make this tutorial as short as possible because I know there are difficulties when you go over a certain length um, of translating the video there are some complications there so that's just something then that we do in a, an up and coming tutorial so last of all thank you very much for listening hopefully you did get some value from this tutorial it's always good to get some feedback i did try and make sure that i coded everything out because i know that sometimes you get a little bit upset when i start to copy and paste things in and and explain more rather than see see me type things out um yeah any feedback that you have will be great and I hope to see you in the next tutorial.